And we're live. Hello, live chat. Let me know if all the sound is good when I start playing videos later, please. And I am joined here currently by uh, Semiagog and Raging Mandrel, and we're going to be discussing the phenomenon of NATO shills, and specifically, uh, we're going to talk about this channel, Perun, for the most part, but I will mention a few other things. And there's actually one particular video from Perun that we're going to be looking at. Uh, so, this is a, a stream I wanted to do quite a long time ago, but various things came up and got in the way, uh, like the American event and, you know, just, just life. Uh, but now we're here and we're going over this. It's an important topic to go over. Uh, so to start out with, uh, do you guys have anything you want to show before I open up with my monologue? Uh, uh, no, nothing, uh, nothing on my end other than, you know, check out my channel if you don't, uh, know it already. Uh, but I imagine most people do. Uh, and yeah, thanks for having me on, uh, Charlemagne. And for my part, just the usual things, uh, Twitter, YouTube, Substack, all of that, ODC, subscribe now. Cool. Yeah. And all that's in the description using my find my friends links, of course. Okay. Let's get into it. I will now share the... Oh, I actually already have a screen share active. Good. I will now share this. And you can see this tab. Yes, okay. I can't see the stream when I click it. Um, okay, so what do I mean when we talk about NATO shills, right? This channel here, Perun, is a NATO shill. What he does is he makes video content... Um, that is effectively just NATO propaganda. It's pro-Ukrainian, anti-Russian propaganda. One of the things interesting about this channel is uh, you can see here, it used to be a sort a gaming channel that uh, covered some random games I've never heard of, and he barely got any views. Then he makes this video here, and uh, it has almost 2 million views now. And this video is basically just a long you know, slideshow presentation. Uh, then he made two more of these gaming videos, and then it transitioned totally to just nothing but uh, Ukraine War Channel. Now, this this is very interesting because this guy just sort of came out of nowhere. And if we go look at uh, his social blade, for example, you can see what I'm talking about, where before the war, this guy was a nobody. Um, and then the war happens, and suddenly he's reaching sizable portions of the Earth's population with uh, his videos. Um this channel is also interesting because I actually watched a good number of these videos in the beginning. Uh, you can still see my marks on some of them. And uh, it's not really obvious that he wasn't being quite as uh, objective as he tries to come across as in these videos. And it took me a while to catch on. Um, so he's, he's a very tricky little fellow. Um, and so, again, you can see the reason I call him – the reason I call these guys shills is – it's. It, they're not necessarily employed by someone, right? The way this works is someone like this guy uh, gets rewarded for having the correct opinions by the algorithm um, and having his videos promoted so that this effect happens to him where he goes from nobody to very important because he's talking about the right things. Uh, you can see a similar thing happen on Kangs and Generals. Um, if you look at Kangs and Generals... Uh, <laughs> They did some uh, history content, right? I mean, most people probably know them. And if you look at this video they did here in April, they did a uh, basically Ukrainian propaganda video about Ukrainian nationalism as some sort of fundraiser. And it got a million views, right? As compared to, you know, about a quarter or sometimes half of that on other topics. Um, and then if you, you just look at, I, you know, I have control F for Ukraine here. If we just look around, you can see 3.4 million views on this one you know, as compared to less than a million on literally all their other content. And then, again, um, this one did kind of poorly for that type of content. But again, here we go, Battle of the Donbass, 1.2 million views. So the, the point is they're rewarded strongly by the algorithm for this Ukraine content um, as compared to the other content. We can look at the videos they just put out, right? So, you know, here's uh, Prigozhin, uh, 300K compared to 78K. Oh, on that one. Um, 
243k on this Britain one, right? So their Ukraine content does really well. And this is what happens across the board because the algorithm's rewarding it. So these guys are basically being paid, possibly without being fully aware of it, although I think Kangs in general is aware of it. Um, they're being paid by the algorithm because these views convert into, you know, ad new or Patreon revenue or whatever. Um, another issue. And well, let's look at the counts on some similar channels first. If we look at like something like Defense Politics Asia, um, I think this is a fairly good channel in, in terms of not being uh, strongly pro-Russian. They have to, they tend to have a uh, pro-Russian slant, but they aren't uh, like some of the you know more native Russian-speaking channels uh, where Russia can never lose. They ha they don't have nearly as many videos, um, uh, video views rather. Like you can see, they're only in the tens of thousands. You know, if we go look at uh, you know Patrick Lancaster, who's you know one of the only journalists making English language content from uh, the Russian side of the line. Um, you know, I would consider this really important content, and you know, he's uh, only sometimes getting close to the type of views that you know Kangs and Generals gets, but nowhere near the millions of views that Perun is netting. So this all just goes to shows us, as will happen with this video as well, is if you're taking the pro-NATO, the strongly pro-NATO line um, regarding this war, you're going to get rewarded. And if you take it from a more neutral perspective or a pro-Russian perspective, you're not going to get rewarded by the algorithm. So that's what makes them uh, shills, uh, witting or unwitting. They are shills um, in more ways than one. Um, so... What was the other? Oh, yes. So the final thing I wanted to mention, just in terms of the type of content here, is Kangs and Generals in particular has a sort of type of watered down content where it facilitates propagandizing people very well because they don't go into fine details. If you watch these videos about the counteroffensive or whatever is happening right now, they show you maps, but you're not getting the sort of daily nitty gritty map updates. Um, if you're closely following the war. So what this allows them to do is kind of make up their own narrative by not really showing you the details or omitting certain details that they don't want you to see. And that's how these really work. So they're netting more views. This type of content is more popular too, probably because most people simply aren't as interested in going through this sort of daily grind type of content. Uh, but because those people aren't interested in it, and you know because these guys uh, are being promoted, they're able to set the narrative more than the channels who are actually covering things in more detail. Perun, most of all, yeah, you know, his his views are dwarfing Kangs and Generals, even where he's literally getting uh, millions of views on some videos. You know, here's this one, 2.1 million views, right? If we go look at his most recent stuff, even the stuff released in the past week is almost at 500k views. I don't I don't know what Kangs and Generals at. They don't get anywhere near that, right? So this channel has developed into an absolutely stellar uh, propaganda channel, basically, out of nowhere. And I'm sure um, Oliver has some things to say about that. And I will now go ahead and pass it to you uh, to take a first stab at any additional commentary you want to add here. Okay, well, thank you. First off, I use Perun as a source, and he has good information, just like the pro-Russia shills, like... Uh, like, uh, what you call it, like, um, uh, Alexander Makuras or the Duran, uh, I hesitate to say Scott Ritter, um, who just is so, uh, slobbers so much, uh, over Russia and about Russia that he's, he's, he's just a bridge too far. Um, so I watch the pro, uh, Russia channels. I also watch, uh, pro Ukraine ones like, uh, Denis Davidov or, uh, Perun, uh, and there are a few others of them. Uh, so I'm not saying that uh, in anything that I'm about to go into here that you can't get good information from Perun. You can. And he has a take, uh, an angle on things that uh, you won't see anywhere else. Um, but, uh, it, it, Main, is it possible for me to uh, share a screen? I guess I just go to share screen. Let me see if I can find it. If it's all right, I want to show you. Uh, where is this one? Yeah, this is the one. Uh, let's see if I can do it. Okay, so if if you want to understand uh, part of why um, Perun got such a bump, it's not just the algorithms. For example, you know, uh, Charlemagne went into this to some extent, but whenever I watch any uh, of the pro-Russia shills, 
uh, I'm always given uh, a pro-Ukraine shill afterwards. I'm always directed immediately to a pro-Ukraine point of view. Uh, on the other hand, of course, as everyone knows, if I watch a NATO shill video, I'm never uh, sent afterwards to a pro-Russia uh, video. So um, there's this algorithmic aspect that we were talking about, but you can also see that if you go to the Euromaidan press page, they'll give you the top 10 YouTube channels to get to get insights into Russia's war uh, with Ukraine. So they lay these ones out. Um, Denis Davidov, one of the ones I watch. Um, Perun, of course. Australian, you know, he's been covering it with new lessons from the conflict and informing future investment decisions. Uh, if you jump over to uh, no less a, uh, a neutral source than the Kiev Post, um, Kiev, Kiev, um, you'll find that uh, Perun is heavily shilled here. And if you watch these uh, videos, uh, any of these people, like if you watch Dennis Davidov, it's like way over the top. But he's fun to watch uh, because not so much because he has much in the way of information, but you can hear what the spin is, uh, how they deal with issues that come up. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, anyway, the point is that it's not just the YouTube algorithms. There's a lot more going on online uh, that's designed uh, to to push Perun. And uh, there are some other things that obviously establish that Perun is a is a wretched uh, shill. Though of course at times he has he has uh, reasonably useful um, information. One of them is that he uh, uses Oryx as a source. And one of his uh, the favorite yeah. techniques is to come up with these crazy graphs and charts that we can all dig into because we can see how malign goes up and the rest. And it's all based on this thing that sounds really great, which is. Um, visually confirmed loss data, which makes, you know, tarts it up uh, immensely in order to make us all believe that um, that this is uh, reliable information, except it's not. Uh, Oryx is uh, run by guys who have a background with uh, Bellingcat and IHS Janes. Um, and then there's, a, or one of them is Bellingcat and IHS Janes. The other one works for Bellingcat. And then there's another one who uh, is a contributor who's a, obviously an, a NAFO uh, guy. Um, and if you go look at one of these guys, where is he? That's just the Oryx website. But if we go over to, uh, that's the other guy, Just Olimans. Um, but the, the, the one who's just a NAFO uh, dirtbag, where is he? Oh, I went over to the wrong place. Let me get back over here to him. Jakub Janowski. Um, you can see his pinned tweet. This is the this is the the neutral source uh, of visually confirmed lost data that that Perun likes to use. This is one of the contributors. He writes, our total count of visually documented Russian tank losses during their 2022 invasion of Ukraine has reached 2,000 exclamation point. What an epic failure from a self-proclaimed military superpower. Does 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 that sound uh, does that sound uh, neutral? Um, and and you know there are a bunch of problems with this, and because uh, Perun relies upon it so much and makes such a show of tarting up what appears to be data, you know you've got Bellingcat. It styles itself as a fact checker. Um, do any of you think that uh, fact checkers online are uh, reliable? Or, or or IHS Janes, which is simply a mouthpiece for the defense industry. Um, and then you take a look at, you know, their accumulations of photographs, the metadata they claim to review can be stripped. Uh, even if it exists, I have to wonder, wonder about a private website that claims to be checking the meta metadata for every photograph uh, submitted. Um, and uh, if it's really on a, a grassroots thing, as they always claim, how do they have the resources to do this with any thoroughness? Then there's the whole issue of uh, intentional release and intentional suppression of data designed from the outset to paint a particular picture. Um, you know, through propaganda outlets like th th what Oryx itself appears to be. And then and the, all the crap about chronological order. You know, this image was posted, then this image was posted. If you watch the actual videos, you'll see that some of them are a video of some shit playing on a screen. So uh, who's who's to say that it's not a photo from six years ago? Um, even if there were metadata, and I call, call bullshit on this as most of the social media companies strip it, then what do we do in cases where it's just a screenshot of another monitor? or a video on which something else is displayed. And you'll see lots of these. And where's the chain of custody? There's none. 
So you can make choices in what you show and how you show it and, and what you decide is v visually confirmed versus what isn't visually confirmed to just create a, a house of cards. It's all crap. So, you know, Oryx is uh, one of the major problems. If you take a look at Bellingcat, you'll find out that all of these places that they're supposed to be looking into, or the majority of them, Syrian civil war, that's anti-Russian stuff because Russia's involved there and the West wants to make Russia look bad. Bellingcat gets into it. Russia-Ukrainian war, um, the Yemeni civil war, which is um, some have argued is part uh, is being motivated or funded uh, by that block in the background with Iran or the uh, Skripal uh, poisoning uh, or Cameroon, where Russia has uh, good relationships in uh, Africa. So these guys are all about, quote, unquote, quote, belling the cat. And if you read any number of uh, of white papers from these think tanks and the rest, you'll see that they're they're one of their major things that are pushed as strategy. I just covered one by CSIS um, in my last video where they're talking about what the West has to do is you know publicize what it is Russia's doing so that people see and they're shamed. It's the exact same thing as Bellingcat here. And let's remember that Bellingcat itself is coming out of Britain which is the most vociferous, loud war hawk uh, voice about the Ukraine war, even more so that, than the United States, which tries to have a certain amount of plausible deniability. So uh, the other thing you should do is take a look at Perun's videos and look at the titles and look at the dates uh, and you'll see what comes out and when. And you'll see that there's a very interesting pattern. So if, there's a quest, if there are questions about tanks being sent, then go check out his video, which will appear around the time that's in the discourse. And it's a video on why that's a good thing, uh, why escalation isn't an issue, why we should have done it sooner, why we should have sent more. Uh, ditto for cluster munitions. You'll find a whole um, uh, piece on why it's not a big deal. They've already been used. Mines are worse. Uh, and it's a great thing that they're being sent uh, because Ukraine needs um, cluster munitions. Same for jet jets. Um, <clears throat> if you're in fear of nuclear escalation, then just go watch the escalation strategy and aid in Ukraine video to learn why there's absolutely no reason to worry and we should get more involved. If you're afraid of sending long range missiles and how that could cause an escalation um, and how the West maybe shouldn't do that, then go watch, uh, go watch Storm Shadow and long range weapons uh, to understand why that's not a problem and we should send more of them and Ukraine just needs more money. If you're worried about hypersonic weapons and what Russia might be able to do with them, then go watch uh, hypersonic weapons, overhyped or super weapons to learn why it's not a big issue. Um, we shouldn't worry about those things and we have to help the plucky Ukrainians. Look at his name. It's the name of the Slavic uh, head of the pantheon who's a god of thunder and lightning. I mean, there's absolutely nothing about this guy that doesn't glow. Um, and you talk about, you know, his origin story. You know, it's and they post it like on this uh, Kiev post and, you know, the Maidan press site where it's it's not about uh, it's not about Perun. He doesn't talk about himself because that's not the story. He shouldn't be front and center. The story is really about these plucky Ukrainians. Um, so there's a and, and in terms of the, the mechanism of reward for him. Yes, he gets the promoted by the algorithm and by these thir third party sites and everything. But he's uh, he's also rewarded by the people that he shills. And I think that this is this is just a hypothesis, can't prove it, but I think across the board that people who are willing to uh, to do what they're told and, uh, and and or to have an agenda which is uh, very strongly biased, I think they're rewarded uh, based on the people that they do advertising for. And it just so happened. I mean, if I ran intelligence services and propaganda stuff, then one thing I'd want to do is track uh, usage through VPNs. So why not use VPNs? Uh, as an advertising thing to have a plausibly a plausibly deniable chain uh, of delivery of funds to people who work for you, because after all, they're just advertisers. And at the same time, you can shill your national intelligence services version of a VPN that people go to to imagine that their 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 web activity is hidden when in fact uh, it is for everybody except the VPN. So, I mean, if I ran intelligence services, the first thing I do is start spawning things like proton mail and things like VPNs all over the joint to uh, cause the traffic that wants to be secret to cluster uh, along routes and uh, data courses that I can um, that I can observe uh, very, very closely. Otherwise, I should just say thank you for your patience, everyone, that there's a pretty straightforward Perun formula. 
you know, you've got your snotty, backhanded, snide little anti-Russian remarks that you'll hear peppered in consistently, you know. Well, if Private Conscriptovich was asked to, to climb out of the trench, you know, there's tons of that. There's the use of the Oryx, Oryx data that's all false data. Um, you know, it, it, the, the the systems where... Well, the, not all false data. Well, uh, well I, yeah, I will filled, with some, filled with false data. I, yes. I will get into that when I make my points, yeah. Sorry, yeah. just didn't want to leave that hanging in the air. Yes, yes, that's 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 fair enough. And the other one is like, you know, he, he talks about the people who can chip in to have uh, satellite photos taken of like, you know, Russian tank yards to see how depleted their stocks have become. How come we've never, ever, ever ever seen satellite views of uh nato uh equipment yards ever we've never seen u.s equipment reserves photographed by satellite ever you know so wh wh and why are there never skepticism why is there never ever skepticism about uh, uh western claims ever um and then you know you throw in a little bit of uh, casual slang for the young people yeah hey, fire a shit ton of shells um, you rely heavily on the YouTube algorithms to promote your shilling, which, you know, um, we've already discussed. And um, lastly, the, the most annoying thing about him that just makes me want to stick knitting needles into my eyes is the way he constantly refuses to say cause or effect or any of these things that are just normal human English. You know, it's always impact. It's impacted. And these things are driven by and it's they drive these uptake and uptick and drive and impact and drive and uptick. It's all this shitty, uh, tedious white collar business jargon that's uh, intended to to reach a certain uh, audience. So, yeah, that's my that's my basic uh, opening uh, view of this guy. Uh, although I do want to say again, I watch him as a source and, uh, all the Russian shill sources, uh, should be balanced with, uh, with, uh, uh, uh NATO shill sources as well in order to get something uh, closer to uh, a complete picture, even if that, uh, itself is impossible. Yes. Uh, that's definitely a good point. And, uh, probably for the first year of the war i was watching uh <laughs> freaking ads i was watching the uh peroon every every video he watched uh he put out i would watch it so it is it's a, the the points you made as well it's not like the information he is putting in these videos is necessarily false and the same goes for the russian side it's that it's presented in a way to it's crafted to give westerners a very particular impression across the board uh, of what is happening in the war, but more than that, how they should think about it, right? So it's not like everything he's saying is a lie or something, or that he's not a good source necessarily. Um, it's exactly how the mainstream media operates, right? Uh, they don't they don't outright say, like, we're the objective arbiters of fact necessarily but everything is presented in a way to make it appear that here's the facts we're just laying out the facts for you and letting you uh see through all the propaganda and whatnot and they accuse the you know accuse the russians of propaganda or something even though their own thing is propaganda themselves I should point out here um i'll actually play it really quick um if i share kings and generals they always open their video with uh, one particular thing, so we'll hear it right now. <clears throat> we have now crossed another questionable milestone in the unprovoked Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. Every time, every time <laughs> they open these videos with that exact line. Do you think they came up with that themselves? You know, you make a very the good point unprovoked about... war of aggression. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. yeah, it's it's pro Ukrainian from the very start, just with the language. Yes, yeah, so when they say it, they say that every single time. And and notice, um, and kind of what I'm getting at is that there are other there are other things involved here. Like uh, I lost it on. I should have uh, shouldn't have refreshed the tab. But they opened with this big fundraiser uh, for Ukraine when all of this first started. And I think you, you make interesting points, uh, Oliver, about how these people may be paid sort of under the table 
uh, by the intelligence agencies going through various advertising services and this sort of thing. I have my um, I have my suspicions about War Thunder too, and gaming in general because you can scout talent in terms of response time for like drone operators, um, and uh, at the same time it, the interface for a, a war game. Uh, it can be ported over very easily to the interface that you use for actual remote weapons. Sorry. Let's let's see what they actually say at the beginning of this video. Um... On February 21st, 2022, President Putin appeared on Russian national television. There he denounced the legitimacy of Ukrainian statehood, portraying the Ukrainians as nothing more than a wayward branch of the Russian people, deprived of their natural state of unification with the Russian nation. Suffice to say, this interpretation of history is a fantasy, fashioned as the spear tip of a propaganda campaign to justify naked imperialist ambition. In truth, Ukraine is the cradle of an old culture, with roots that extend farther back than any state born from Moscow. As historians, it is our job to fight authoritarians' attempts to rewrite history. So in this special video, we will examine the origins of Ukrainian culture in the ancient Kievan Rus and the Kingdom of Rosenia, exploring the medieval roots of a storied people whose ethnogenesis began long before there were ever Tsars in Moscow. Kings and Generals is proud to announce that we've partnered with many other historical channels to create Project Ukraine, and we're grateful for their kind participation. Project Ukraine is a playlist dedicated to telling the past of the Ukrainian people to aid them in the present. Your likes, shares and donations to the charity we are collaborating with will have a direct impact in aiding the most vulnerable citizens of Ukraine. We have partnered up with the Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center in Kyiv, which was bombed by the Russian troops at the start oh, of the invasion. Fucking... Today, the foundation has transformed its projects, <laughs> refocusing its resources and we'll, efforts we'll on another... purchasing and delivering humanitarian aid to civilians and evacuating people from combat yeah, zones. In the first week of April, the center provided over 7,000 food baskets to patients and doctors at Kyiv hospitals, to bomb shelters in the Kyiv underground, as well as to people with disabilities and elderly people <clears throat> who cannot leave their homes. They also provided targeted assistance to 3,354 people, delivering specific medications, food and hygiene products on individual requests. We hope that viewers would consider donating to this noble cause and help with the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. All right, shut up. So yeah, that was April 24th. So that's interesting. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, just a quick point. I'm glad you uh, brought up this way in which all the different channels work with each other. Um, because you've got the thing of like, you know, Perrin wants to analyze tanks. So he gets the the that Australian guy who who I think it's Chef Tan or whatever, or English guy, I can't remember what he is, to come in and like talk about or to give him information that he can read uh, on screen to talk more about the reality of this tank or that tank. Tank museums and the people who work in them. Again, I'm not sure about the Chef Tan guy, but, but those are former military people who get given little sinecures on, on the side after they retire in order to be able to work at a tank museum. It's not like an easy job to get. You have to come out of the military and, you know, it's a bone that they throw you uh, when your career's done. So, you know, the same thing with these different like military arms experts online, they're all tied to the military, whether they're, you know, active or uh, retired. And so we see these sets of channels that come together and we know for a fact that the NAFO shit exists. And it's, so on top of that, you know, all of this piling up as evidence that the last thing Perun or any of these other people are, are independent operators, uh, in my view, uh, this is my suspicion, uh, I obviously cannot prove any of it. Um, the last thing we get is that people like Perun come on and they say, well, I checked, you know, to find out uh, about this or that thing. You know, and uh, I was lucky enough to be able to talk with some, you know, military expert who cleared up this, that or the other thing for me. How many people can just reach out to the active military to get them to, you know, go into details for them uh, about shit? I mean, the, 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 the infrastructure, the mutual support network, all of it screams uh, an organized, integrated operation, which we have every reason to expect exists. And we've even been bluntly told exists, at least in the form of uh, NAFO. All right, so what we're going to do now, I will uh, note that the Prudentialist has joined us and welcome him, and we'll let him uh, 
give any opening statements in a bit. I wanted to pass it to Mandrel uh, first, though, since um, he may have something to add. But before I do that, uh, just want to point out here, I, I brought up that Project Ukraine playlist. And in that Kangs and Generals video, we saw very clearly, they just lay it out for you, that there is a huge organizational effort behind all these YouTube channels. Um, you can see it right here on the screen. It's not like it's happening in secret, right? And then we can infer... Uh, some of the things Oliver mentioned uh, when he, you know, first presented uh, about 10 minutes ago in terms of like, where's the, what what else is going on here, right? Who else is actually funding these people? Because we, there's obviously, you would have to be, you know, born yesterday to think that this is just all like some sort of organic YouTuber coalition happening on its emergent. Face it's emergent. Yeah, emergent. That's the word, emergent, right? This is just an emergent phenomenon. No, of course it isn't. Um, so that's, that's the... A uh, real point to hammer hone here, and yeah. So, Mandrel, uh, do you want to add anything? Uh, you know, take as much time as you want before uh, we uh, pass to credentials. Sure. Um, I'll say first off that uh, I wanted to piggyback off the Oryx point. Oryx, as a source, I have always, always, always had a problem with for their casualty count, even from the earliest days of the war. And the biggest reason that I have to doubt them in their casualties is because in the early days, especially Ukraine and Russia are using a lot of the same military equipment, which harken back to the old Soviet days. When you see a burned out BMP or a burned out T-72 or what have you, old Soviet era kit, basically, and there's no markings on it. How do you tell whose tank it is? How do you tell whose truck it is? You can't really, uh, unless you have some other like video clip or something else that it gets posted. Right. Um, and so that's the first reason that I've always doubted their count because they, they basically from the earliest days claims that Russia was taking more casualties than the Ukrainians. They've always claimed throughout the entirety of the conflict that Ukraine has been taking Sorry, not Ukraine has been taking more casualties, but that Russia has been taking more casualties. And that's never changed as far as I can tell from their documentation that I've, I've seen at least last week. Um, however, the one thing that they are good at documenting is the coalition uh, that NATO seems to have thrown together in order to provide equipment aid. Um, everything that's, that's post-Soviet aid or even Soviet era aid that's that's all been documented by them um for the most part seemingly for for the most part pretty well um there are other places you can go to that are better um wikipedia it would give you more specific numbers than oryx typically does um but oryx specifically as a source is is obviously as, as Simia noted there they've been nato shells the entire way through and so if Perun is using them as a source and just taking them at face value and saying, oh, their casualty numbers are genuine, right? Oh, look at how many, look how many tanks Russia's lost this week. Oh, oh, you know, and of course, we've always known that the Ukrainians have, even from the earliest days of the conflict, way, 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 way overestimated how many Russians that they were killing and how many casualties in terms of equipment and personnel that they were, they were dealing onto the Russians. Quick, quick so, point, Mandrel just so that nobody hammers you about it later. Uh, Perun does go in and say that we can't rely on this data. Obviously, there are flaws in it, but but it, 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 it it's very likely indicative of trends. So just uh, to say the same way I was corrected earlier, so we don't get hammered by the NAFO gang, he, he does put little plausible deniability inserts in there. But nevertheless, he proceeds with his diagrams and the rest as though it's reliable. Yeah, and I want to be very clear as well on on the numbers and and the types of equipment that are advertised as given. Um, the equipment that that you see in terms of numbers, both on Oryx and Wikipedia or wherever else source that you might find it through, you know, open source reporting or whatever, uh, those are usually going to be ballpark numbers. It's very very. Um, uh, it's less common to see things be like, yes, actually, we gave them, you know, specifically 37 
you know, BMP ones or whatever. It's very rare. Does that happen? There are a couple of circumstances where that has happened, where, where specific numbers for like exam, for example, the M 55 S, which I constantly reference, um, that there's a very specific number that's attached to that piece of equipment that's been explained over and over again. Um, but other pieces of equipment where you start getting into BMP ones and T 72s and all of that stuff, um, the numbers are a lot more opaque, but what Oryx and what you could look at on Wikipedia and other sources to, and if you really collate the data gives you is a ballpark number, um, which of course I've, I've given my figures on Charlemagne's channel before. Um, so yeah, that's just my, my really long winded take on why Oryx should be taken with a grain of salt. And, and realistically, as I've always said, we cannot know what the true casualty figures are until long after this war is over. We can only, we're, we're looking at the fog of war right now. And so you really can't see how many people exactly are going to get killed. And of course the videos that we see posted on Russian telegram or on, or that the Ukrainians post you know, with Ukraine weapons tracker or whatever, those are all going to be weeks old videos, right? They're not going to show you an, an up-to-date, you know, tactical picture or operational picture because all of that stuff has to be edited. They add music to it for dramatic effects. They add special effects and all of that stuff. Um, so really you're, there's also the, uh, the time lag that you're getting with perceiving what's happening on the ground in the teeny tiny snippets that you're looking at. Um, and so, may I, uh at a point if you're about to move on from equipment since uh, i can't have you being more long-winded than me uh, <laughs> they 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 th there's a thing that happened in my argument with ivan sometime back where he was saying that an elite group of russians were knocked out in the early days of the war and we know it because they were using the t-80u which is an elite russian tank and if you go research anything about the t-80u you find out that those tanks are more common in Ukrainian service than in Russian, that they're manufactured domestically or were up to a point by Ukraine. Um, it, so, so it, 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 it's, they, they bullshit from every direction. You know, they yes. say, well, we've got these T-80U tanks, so we know that it must have been an elite group. But as soon as you scratch the surface, you find out, no, there are more of them in use by U Ukraine, which goes to your original point where these guys are using the same equipment. Well, yeah. it's uh, it, it it what it does is they're they're not lying per se, right? That's the trick. They're like it, it makes sense to a person who doesn't actually scratch the surface. You're like, oh, T-80U, uh, this is one of their best tanks. Oh, they're blown up. Must have been elite units. Russia puts elite troops in them. Uh, there you go, right? So, but they, if you don't realize the other part, they're not telling you, like you just said. That's how they get you, right? And that's that's the trick of really good propaganda is not lying uh, per se, right? The photos on Oryx, for example, those are real photos of real destroyed tanks. Um, but, you know, as we know, both sides have captured each other's um, equipment and it's all Soviet equipment anyway. So, and also, you know, anyone can paint a Z on a tank and take a picture of it uh, as well. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. and, and we, not uh, to say... Not to say that the Russians don't, uh, Russian shills don't do it too. Of there course. are all kinds of cases where the, the, the Mercurius gang does the exact same yes. thing, but I watch them too because they have information also. Yes. Yeah. And, absolutely. and on, right, well, let's, let's go to the Prudentialist and then uh, I'll pass okay. it back to you, Mantle. So uh, welcome to the stream, Mr. Prudentialist. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Sorry I was late. I was just driving home from church, but happy to be here. I, I want to echo Mr. Mantle's point that we're not going to get an accurate number on casualties anytime soon. This is going to be long after. I think what Semi Agog had just said prior to getting into some of these remarks is that you kind of do have to look at how large a role the media ecosystem plays. And I don't mean mainstream news. We see this with Telegram as well, the YouTube channels that you had just listed. Uh, I want us to take a, an example from a, a previous global issue that had fucked us all over a few years back. Uh, that of, of course, with COVID. You go back to, say, one of the most well-trafficked websites in the world, which I think at the time of, in 2020, it was like number four or seven, uh, reddit.com, like the opening bits of the plague that had happened. 
uh, a lot of the top news articles from these progressive sock dem types was China bad. We can't let the Chinese do this. And then all of a sudden, about sometime mid-March, first week of April, uh, the marching orders came out. And this was all going to be about Donald Trump and the 2020 election. So there's, you know, we talk about coordination or emergent phenomenon. There really isn't a lot of emergence here. And if there's um, uh, someone who's been on Patrick Casey's show a few times, the Z blog, he had an interesting point where, it, you know, a lot of these things are kind of like bees. You know, they, they don't need a queen to offer directions, but they do have these hormonal tendencies that, you know, allows these all people to sort of swarm in at once and come up about these things. And so when we talk about, you know, the, the historiography or whatever kind of narrative you're going to get from these YouTube channels or even a discussion over the ethnicities, you're going to get a, uh, I don't want to use the word Russophobic, but you are going to get a, a rather anti-Slavic and anti-Russian sort of similar to how the French and the British did during prior to World War One. this great concern about uh, what do we do about Russia. And the same thing is going to happen here. This You're going to see a mixture of historiographies get blended together really poorly. Um, you're going to see this especially when it comes to, say, the church. Um, you're going to see all sorts of weird stuff about the unionists and then the Orthodox and the Catholics. You're going to see this then be integrated, of course, with the uh, you know what Zelensky is doing and so on. Um, and it's just a really ugly mess. And you're going to see full spectrum propaganda at its highest from people that think that they are meaning well. People always, especially in the West, want this idea that they are doing the right thing, that they feel good about themselves, and that, you know, these guys are clearly doing the right thing. They've got a fundraiser. They're saving children and whatnot. And it's like what Mandrill and Semyagog said. There's going to be very little surface scratching, and no one is going to pause and think, well, wait a second. If I pull on this one thread, uh, things stop making sense in the way that this narrative has been presented to me. Um and of course, for the audience listening, I just have been mainly looking at the war from second order effects like the grain deals, the energy issues between Russia, Ukraine, the Black Sea, Turkey, sort of things that are not day to day on the ground, but more second order consequences, because that has, for right now, a much more measurable um, impact that we can look at and gauge based on how the war is going without being able to go into the fog of war and try and dive through the weeds of casualty counts and the like. But um you know, there's a lot of coordinated efforts from governments. We saw this with the NAFO, you know, the, the quote unquote, the fellas um, and their little Vilnius uh, summit as well. And people showing off their dysgenic faces behind the doggo. So we uh, we live in some pretty fake and gay uh, kinds of uh, propaganda. And I can't wait for what comes next, because after this war, you know, it's going to get only gayer uh, with the propaganda. <laughs> yes. And, you know, why why cover this at all? Well, you know, why don't we do a stream about Russia shills? Well, it's because we're not, we're being inundated with pro NATO propaganda by five eyes, basically. And we're not getting inundated with, uh, you know, Russia shell propaganda. You really have to actively seek out anything pro Russian um, if you're going to ever see it. So yeah. that's why this topic needs to be addressed specifically. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And of course, you expect Russia to be pro Russia, right? Um, you don't expect, like, especially if you're looking at MOD releases or, you know, Intel Slava Z or something like that on Telegram, you don't expect them to be pro-Ukraine. Like, you don't expect Russians with attitude who are, like, obviously patriotic Russian guys, just apparently dudes on, who are in Russia, whatever. Like, you don't expect them to be not pro-Russia, okay? So you just, you take it for what it is which is, okay, this is what the Russians are saying, this is what they're thinking, this is what their perception is, and based off of the, the, the data that they have available to them, this is what they think is going on. Um, which is a totally different formulation than just saying, oh, well, this this one guy on Telegram who happens to be Russian said, you know, the God's honest truth, and that's, that's it. No, that's not how you think about things. I, I may want to also throw in maybe just to play devil's advocate a bit, because I remember that this is something that you, Oliver, and Tim used to talk about a while back, was that there is an obvious, there is Russian influence when it comes to American politics, and it does have a tendency to find itself on the right, um, more so than it does, say, on the left or anything like that. I mean, one doesn't need to scratch the uh, the surface of, I think, a Mr. Jackson Hinkle and maybe wonder if he's, you know, been registered with the Foreign Agent Registry Act or things <laughs> like that. Uh, there's an, a huge influence on sort of Russia and the South as well. Um, you know, uh, there's 
a lot of uh, jokes and references made with, say, sort of the, the Dukes Novo of Luhansk, Novorossiya flag, Novo flag, flag. And, and the stars and bars. There is something there. Um, and I think that what gets unfortunately collated, and I think that the Russians know this and they do this quite well because anyone can look from the outside and recognize that like right wingers and conservative ink in general has no power in America that, oh, it's really easy to conflate pro Russian talking points into genuine, honest American calls for maybe not giving um, this cocaine addict a bunch of billions of dollars and more money or that, that, you know, those what gets called isolationist sympathies, those they do exist and they are real. Um, and sometimes they're a little harder to find because our eyes are so looking towards the, the, the NAFO or the five eyes stuff. But it is out there um, and it's a little more pernicious because we don't see it like we see all this stuff on YouTube or on the television shows or on uh, mainstream media broadcasting because that stuff in the West is inundated day in and day out with Sean Hannity like talking points saying, you know, um, Vladimir Putin is the next Adolf Hitler. Whereas, you know, if we wanted to find a good Russian talking points or whatnot, like they're not going to present themselves in the media. The Russians know how America's media ecosystem works. They don't play that game. Um, you have to go to Telegram. You have to go find certain personalities and track down where these things get said. And this is on top of the fact that numerous people will call out that stuff as Russian disinfo. So, it, you know, one is much more louder than the other. But just to play devil's advocate, it's certainly out there in the weeds on the pro-Russia side. Okay, so shall we actually start digging into some of this uh Perun content now uh, the one i had uh queued up by all means yes yeah, so let's go do we want to do we want to just uh try watch and get straight through or do we want to jump to any timestamps? um uh, all right, i don't I will, know uh, it's gonna hurt start. either way. dealer's choice it's still gonna it's, suck it's gonna hurt <laughs> yeah. um, i have some timestamps laid out but we'll we'll just start going through this thing um, embrace the suck let's see invasion of ukraine I expect that observers around the world are preparing to reflect on where things stand after a year of hard fighting. On the 15th of February, the chairman of the US Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, offered his own summary. The general contended that Russia had lost strategically, operationally and tactically. The Ukrainians fighting on in the trenches around Bakhmut. I'm not sure how well the general's words would have reconciled with constant Russian artillery bombardments and attacks that continued day after day. After almost a year of fighting, there is no doubt that the Russian military continues to apply enormous pressure and that it remains capable of slowly grinding forward towards its objectives. But Putin did not launch this war to raise the Russian flag over the destroyed remains of Bakhmut. Putin's war, like most others, was launched to achieve a set of strategic objectives. And while the future of the war in Ukraine or the results of any particular battle are still up for determination, in that strategic respect, Mark Milley's words, I would argue, hold true. By the so, just kind of right there. I mean, he's just sort of declaring the purpose of the war, just up front. Uh, I mean, I get what he's saying, but he's basically going to be claiming that the war has to meet this purpose that he's defining, or else, you know, Russia standards loses. the Russians themselves set. The invasion of Ukraine has been a strategic calamity. It has weakened Russia, strengthened its geopolitical rivals. And no matter how the war ends from here, it's hard to see how that changes. And so today, rather than talk about a particular system, about tanks, about aircraft or a particular battle, I want to zoom out and look at this war at a grand strategic level. I want to examine what the Russians were trying to achieve and how all those objectives have been undone. One oh, so one reason I picked this one too is he is actually bad at this. Um, he's very good at the statistics oriented videos where he does a lot of citing of uh, oryx or whatever but this is yeah, this lo video logistics is different. and supply chains and production and economics yeah yes that's where he really shines this is not uh the area he shines in where he's sort of theorizing about strategy uh were you gonna say anything yeah, I, I just wanted to say very quickly is it, it surely it must just be an absolute coincidence it's entirely emergent uh that uh that you know, he just happens to be hammering on this point that Russia has already lost, and that Milley himself said Russia's already lost, and that today we see that hammered on again and again by uh, you know Jake Sullivan types and Newland types and the State Department and uh, and Biden himself. It's just a coincidence that they're all saying the same thing that Russia already lost, 
And it's just a coincidence that we saw this theme uh, developed months ago uh, here and in other places. And then it finally uh, rose to the surface coming out of the, the, the mouths of people like Biden uh, at this point. Surely just a coincidence. One by one. And in doing so, I want to establish the fact that while some degree of Russian strategic defeat now seems inevitable, the results for Ukraine are not baked in. Russian strategic defeat doesn't necessarily have to mean a Ukrainian strategic victory. Well, the fight for a powerful, restored Russian empire has... Yeah. He, he always does this. He's he hedging. Always, he always hedges in this way. He just did it recently in his... I was uh, going to pause to say the exact point. Yeah. <laughs> where he says, cluster munitions, you know, we have to understand that artillery is where you get the highest number of casualties. And of course, that's something all the Russian uh, side has been talking about. And I acknowledge it. Everybody, you know, Jimmy Thomas talks about it and he has a military background. The largest number of casualties do come from cluster munitions. But what Perrin says immediately after that in that cluster munitions video is, but, but, but we shouldn't jump the conclusions that simply because Russia has more artillery, it means that they're doing more casualties. So he'll tell you everything's going to be all right. It's really good. Um, actually, Ukraine is winning. Actually, Russia's using, uh, losing. Uh, but then they'll, he'll turn around immediately, as you say, he'll hedge and he'll say, but that's no reason for us to relax and we need to send them more of our shit. I just find it funny that prior to this, he was a, a, a gaming channel. And then the first video comes up March 5th, 2022, all bling, no basics, why Ukraine's embarrassed the Russian military. Uh, last video he had um, was about Phoenix Point festering skies. And that was, a you know, 11K views. And then, bam, nearly 2 million. Um, just it feels like something has just been injected into this man to discuss these things from whatever he was doing previously, which just seems to be video games or something like that. I just, these are things I want to keep in the uh, back of everyone's mind that this guy is clearly probably doing some research and then getting his talking points from somewhere because this is not what he used to be doing on this channel prior to the war. No, some, somehow he switched to putting an enormous amount of time into this. Uh, the guy is obviously either extremely well-trained in this sort of professional marketing type presentation, uh, or there's a whole team behind this somehow. It's very strange. Um, probably already been lost. But the fight for a free, independent and prosperous Ukraine, that very much goes on. So in trying to break up this rather ambitious topic, I'm going to try and do a couple of things. First, I'm going to look at Russia's history of empire. All right. So this is that part where he sort of lays out what he's going to do. I think, uh, Oliver, you sort of mentioned that he does this at the beginning of every video. And that it matters. Whether it be the and it maps to whatever the initial point is. You'll find out that it's a way to to obliquely present whatever it is that at that time um, NATO communication staff would wish to um, push like, oh, you're afraid of nuclear ex uh, escalation? Then watch escalation strategy and aid in Ukraine. And these little bullet pointed lists lay out exactly how he's going to tell you why we shouldn't be worried about escalation. And the last thing I should point out is that a propaganda in the West is w it, it, with the famous names. If you look at um, uh, Edward Bernays, uh, if you look at uh, Lippmann, these guys, if you dig into it, you find out that Bernays, that Lippmann and, and, and uh, Poison Ivy Lee uh, as well, I believe, uh, Ivy Lee, um, who gets a lot less attention, um, they came out of the World War I uh, propaganda service in the United States. So the, the very people that we think of as being the greats the historical greats who who brought in proper marketing and advertising and manipulation, you know, the the manufacture of consent, that whole narrative, they came out of military uh, communications and propaganda departments. So before they established what we think of as modern mass manipulation in the civilian domain, they they cut their teeth in the realm of uh, just this sort. In, in this case, I can only assert it as speculation in Perrin's case because we have no evidence, but I would argue what is very likely just the same sort of thing that we see with Perrin here. So if you wonder why they're good at it, there's a long history of it. Can I, can I add to that real quick? I think it's yeah. really important to consider when you read 
uh, Lippmann's Public Opinion and a lot of his other works, so one thing that he takes a lot of time breaking down is his World War I experience. Why do we know so little as Westerners about what took place during the Russian Civil War after the Bolshevik Revolution? Is because a lot of reporting that went to Western newspapers, and Lippmann talks about this in Public Opinion, is, is that it was reporting on other people's reporting. And that has been the way that the news has more or less been operating now for over a century. And I think that that's something really important to keep in mind when we take a look at this. Because he's, you know, he's reporting on the reporting of others now reporting to you. Um, and there's this like chain of um, informational, you know, there's this chain of evidence that we're, we're going to break down now from. So we can't really be looking at how Perun necessarily spins it, although we will. I think it's also important to consider that he's reporting on the reporting of others. And this is something that we've seen out of Lippmann, Bernays and others, uh, because, you know, we rely on experts. This is Lippmann's famous point. We live in pseudo reality. And so we require people to report on other things for us. And this is what Perun is really good at. But this goes back to the times of the First World War. Yeah, good point. And yeah, none of this is really his spin. He's just reporting other people's spin in a uh, more condensed form, maybe you would say. Um, I think I'm going to skip ahead past the most of the Russian history, unless anyone had any anything in there. All he does is talk about sort of the collapse of the Soviet Empire and makes some parallels. Um, yeah, it, kind of... everything that he talks about for that, just to summarize, is to establish yeah. that they have all kinds of ineptitude, that they're aggressive, that they want to move to these other countries, that the the countries who've escaped their orbit, you know, are, you know, dashing, um, plucky, you know, young countries that, you know, deserve their chance and that historically there have been all these problems. He, he sets the stage with his historical context in precisely the way you would imagine. Exactly. It's, it's all the typical... Uh, Russia has this, uh, you know, eternal aggression to expand into its eastern neighbors and neighbors. And there's this like Soviet revanchism going on. So we will go ahead and get to the contemporary period because I don't necessarily want to watch the whole video. Uh, so there, there was and something. So the here, moment uh, most people and countries were finally given a choice as to whether they wanted to be part of the Soviet or communist project or not. Well, they voted not. OK, so they voted not. Keep that in mind. Ukraine voted to not be part of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev is often blamed for bringing down the Soviet Union by giving out freedoms that destabilize the fragile Soviet system. There may be some truth to that, but I have to ask the question, would those freedoms have been so dangerous if everyone didn't already want to leave? I've often heard American and other English-speaking apologists for Russia talk about Ukraine and describe the fact that there are parts of Ukraine which are naturally part of Russia, that Russia's territorial ambitions are understandable. But what I think that analysis misses is what the numbers say. In 1991, when Ukrainians were given a choice to vote for independence from the USSR, 92.3% of Ukrainians voted yes. So that's so okay. So he brings out that number: 92% of them voted yes. Obviously, that's an average. Uh, kind of interesting, though, that uh, you know, f only 54% of the people in Crimea wanted to. Uh, leave the Soviet Union. That's really interesting considering when you look at it from the other direction. I mean, you know, the, the image we have of the Soviet Union and how horrible it was according to that image uh, and barely more than half of the people in Crimea at that point, the moment it collapsed, wanted to leave. That's an interesting well, number. Well, I mean, that's 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 ago. where the, yeah, this is also, also where the areas of, of highest Russian concentration are. So, of course, if you're asking them, hey, do you want to leave the Soviet Union? If if you're a Ruski who thinks that, you know, the Soviet Union equals Russia, you know, then you can get you can get conflations there. And, and that's why you get the result that you get there. And you, you also have to understand that in 1991, uh, Russia was literally shattered and falling to pieces. And there subsequently, and this affected uh, you, the, what is now the Ukraine uh, in the same way, um, or what is now Ukraine, and as of, I guess, 1991 was, um, uh, people were literally drinking themselves to, de to death in ways more so than historically you would have seen in a place like Russia. Like the, the, the economic disaster that was unfolding at this point was savage. 
I remember I got to see an exhibition of uh, photography done by a Russian photographer in this period. And all he did was travel to different cities and different parks and different underpasses and photograph the thousands and thousands of absolutely impoverished, dying, starving people, you know, were riddled with, you know, hepatitis and all kinds of problems. I mean, Russia at this point was absolutely uh, shattered. I mean, this was the beginning of it. This was the point where it was uh, incipient, but a lot of people could read the writing on the wall. Uh, so if they decided that they wanted to move along as an independent state here, um, you know, th there are other things in that would have driven the response numbers that we see reflected here um, that that don't have anything to do with nationalism. They had to do with like the prospect of uh, survival over the subsequent like five years or whatever. The other deal is that uh, imagining that how they voted here at this time, imagining that these numbers are uh, reliable and that really did represent a snapshot of people's attitudes at the time <clears throat> may well be the case, but w we can't be sure of it. Uh, the, the one thing we do know is that we've had plans uh, for quite some time to shatter. Uh, the West has had plans, uh, Britain and the United States in particular, and Poland, as we covered in the pr on the Prometheanism stream uh, that uh, Charlemagne and Prude uh, did with me, as well as Zellner over on my channel. Um, we've had plans for ages to peel uh, parts off of Russia. Uh, since 1991, when all this went forward, we've done it step by step, uh, incrementally and methodically, swiftly in some cases. So the, the idea that there weren't operatives on the ground, you know, uh, tweaking numbers in these regions, even at this point, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure we should accept that at face value. Right. Well, you have to assume that these literal Soviet elections are completely legitimate elections. Uh, so anything you could say about the elections that occurred uh, in uh, Novorossiya, according to the Russians, uh, last year, right? Like, there's really no reason to believe that there's any difference between the level of legitimacy of those elections, just like on their face, in terms of who's running them. I mean, if anything, this and election you would you would think would probably be less legitimate, as it's literally a Soviet election, right? I mean, just as not not just the way people tend to think about these things, right? We're talking. This is a Soviet election, um, but he doesn't. Yeah, point and that we out. can. We, he treats and we it can like, now. Uh, the this is the flourishing of democracy in Ukraine, right? But of course, what actually happened here is the presidents of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus conspired to dissolve the Soviet Union and take power for themselves. I mean, Ukraine was ripped away from Russia by the oligarchs in Ukraine, who had the opportunity to um, steal a whole country, basically. So, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to be fair, it's not like we can trust our own elections. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, so, well, majorities were achieved in every single <clears throat> oblast, including notably both Crimea and the Donbass. Whether it was the Baltic states or Ukraine or the Central Asian countries, the moment the people of these areas were given a choice of freedom and independence, they took it with both hands. Those same old mistakes had felled yet another empire, but Russia hadn't run out of chances yet. The 1990s were a time of chaos, but they also began as an era of promise. Make no mistake, Russia in 1990 had suffered immensely from the breakup of the Soviet Union, but a majority of the population supported independence and they supported Yeltsin. All right, so I kind of want to skip to the Primakov Doctrine here, um, <clears throat> unless anyone wants to see anything in this section. And he also talks about Dugan, but I don't find Dugan particularly irrelevant to uh, any of this, to be honest. Um, yeah, is everyone okay nothing, with that? Nothing for me. Okay. So let's go to the Primakov Doctrine. Oh, yeah. I'm going to go with the former foreign minister as opposed to a bit. Doctrine. This was a... Lavrov predicted that historians might coin a new term, the Primakov Doctrine. This was a set of principles and objectives that the former foreign minister had advanced as ideas to help guide Russian strategic decision making. So when looking at the indicator of what the Russian government is thinking, I'm going to go with the former foreign minister as opposed to the Rasputin cosplayer. The oh my god, I can't stand that guy. That was a reference to Dugan, by the way, but actually I wanted to bring up another point. Um, because I, I thought he was going to talk about the Donbass elections. But I guess the point is, why aren't the elections that occurred in 2022 in Luhansk, Donetsk, 
Zaporozhia and Kherson not legitimate expressions of democracy. Those people there voted majority to secede from Ukraine and join Russia. So why is why is that not legitimate? But this Soviet election uh, was legitimate. I mean, that's that's the question here. Right. But obviously he has no answer to that. Doctrine has been expressed a few different ways by Western observers, but a few key principles do hold true. The first principle is that Russia must seek to undermine U.S. power and influence. There can be no unipolar world dominated by the United States. Oh, also, sorry to keep pausing it, but as we saw in 91, only 54% of Crimeans allegedly wanted to uh, secede from the Soviet Union. So is it really hard that considering everything that's happened in the last 30 or so years since then, is it really so hard to imagine that that might have tipped the other way in favor of Russia at this point? Um, and Crimea really, the Crimeans really do want to majority join Russia um, back in 2014. And if so, why would that not be legitimate? You know, just questions. And there's, a, there, there's also the fact that you've got a sizable minor, minority and minorities need certain uh, cultural protections. So even in, uh, you know, 91, based on those uh, uh, quote unquote election figures that uh, he uses, there were huge proportions. I mean, when you talk about a minority, uh, you, you know, anything from 20 to, uh, I don't know, what was it, 56 percent of people. You know, it was only 54 that wanted to um, leave in Crimea. So you had, what, 46, uh, yeah. I should say. Um, those are enormous minorities that require uh, protection. And the, 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 the fact of the matter is things like the, the record of uh, Russian diplomatic attempts before uh, war more fully broke out, they, they, it's, it's there on paper that they're saying they want minority protections and cultural protections and linguistic protections that uh, manifestly the, uh, the Ukrainians uh, were completely unwilling uh, to provide. Um, uh, contributing or uh, perhaps even precipitating, you know, the the outbreak of violence more completely. Now, I'm more of a like a, a realist. Uh, I don't think Russia fully intended to stick with that. If 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 uh, minority protections had been given, the Russians would have kept driving a wedge in in order to culturally peel those areas off. But I think they would have been perfectly happy with installing their own politicians as they've been doing previously with uh, Ukraine. Um, I don't believe in any of the elections. I believe that, um, you know, Russia all through um, the historical period from 91 up until uh, the Maidan in 2014, uh, Russia was just obliquely controlling uh, the nation with with speed bumps and problems with gas being siphoned off and, you know, with struggle, with difficulty, uh, with the certainly with the Western portions uh, like, uh, you know, what were historically called Galicia or whatever. Um, but it, it, Russia would have uh, peeled off those those areas anyway. Uh, the thing is that this is an illustration of how uh, Perun turns the data in a particular direction. You know, you could say all these people wanted to leave, but uh, as I just did, you could turn around and say enormous minorities by any standard were looking for uh, protection of their rights and interests, and uh, and we, we we've seen that. Um, the central government in Ukraine was absolutely unwilling to to provide them. Right. You know, on that map, even as far west as Odessa, the, the vote was only 85 um, percent to secede from the Soviet Union. So you end up with a fairly large minority. All right. So back to the Primakov doctrine, which is sort of the, the foreign policy he's claiming that they're aiming for. The second is that Russia must have primacy in the post-Soviet space and lead integration in that region. Now, that obviously instantly means that states that used to be part of the Soviet Union, like the Baltic states or Ukraine, are off limits for Western influence. And if Russia can extend its control over those nations in the formal Warsaw Pact as well, well, then all the better. And given that objective, it naturally extends to the idea that NATO expansion is to be resisted and avoided. If you think about it for more than two seconds, it really is a logical extension. It is much harder for Russia to exercise influence and control over a country if it's under the NATO security guarantee, or if it's economically integrated into the European Union. On their own, many former Soviet states would be no match for Russia. There would be immense economic, political, and potentially military pressure for them to fall in line. But if you go and let countries like Estonia join NATO, well, then they might get big ideas about being independent from Russian influence. 
And that, most figures in the Russian government would suggest, is directly contrary to Russia's strategic interests. Now, I have heard the argument before so that Russian doctrine and strategic... You could pause. So I, I see why he says he doesn't want to do the whole Rasputin LARPer or whatever, because that's basically Foundations of Geopolitics, 1995, and that first caught my attention in 2016 when all the russia gate stuff was happening because everyone was just like this is the man that's you know part of this influence doctrine and uh you know and i've realized in college it was really hard to find an actual translation of it but those the points that he lays out are more or less what he wants to to do in that book as to how to sort of reestablish a more stronger russian geopolitical position and that hybrid efforts also include um sort of targeting racial issues inside of america and using hybrid beings to disrupt stuff but like that's th this is basic if i'm a weaker power and i am trying to upend a nation or a or, or an or a hegemon that has explicit ways and means of power over me which at the time of the 1990s the united states definitely did and arguably still does you know you're gonna have to disrupt them by other means and this has been a long trending debate inside like the school of realism like kenneth waltz had famously argued that um the world typically operates better under like a, a bipolar system rather than sort of a unipolar system but again like this is um it's not a defensive strategy. It, Russia, oper it's offensively realist. But again, we're not going to, I'm not going to even claim that it's a defensive strategy. It's clearly more of a, a strategy of offensive reclamation. But here we are. Yes. And I mean, I mean, the point is too, like, he acts like this is not a legitimate aim of the Russian Empire, but apparently it's legitimate for the United States to be doing the same thing. I, I guess the, the problem here is he tries to have it both ways. Um, he tries to have it, to which where... you can't exactly. Like it so just, we don't have, it, we don't have to, we don't have to pretend like it is defensive. Right. But we can yeah. acknowledge that he's trying to have this pretense on the other side. Like I, I know it's my, my hypocrisy gets old, but it's just like, you can go to the Rand Corp right now and read a dozen different white papers on how the United States should undermine Russia through the last 20 years or so. You, By all means, feel free to read them. Um, they're interesting papers, and some of them do get used in terms of officiating government policy. Same with uh, numerous other think tanks in Washington, including that wargaming discussion that we just had a few weeks back. Like, that's another Center for New American Security. Uh but yeah, you know, uh, this is the way that it's go. One one side is legitimate, one side is the other. And that's really the, what this core linguistic game is going to play here, is, is that he wants to have it both ways, but in this instance, uh, you know, anything that is said here just isn't legitimate, period. Thinking is essentially defensive in nature. Here is how the argument goes. Russia has been invaded multiple times throughout its history. Its borders aren't very defensible because they're mostly flat and open. The country was traumatized by invasions by people like Napoleon and Hitler, and as a result, Russia seeks to expand its influence to create a geographical buffer zone. In order to defend itself, it wants to put other countries, like buffer states of the former Warsaw Pact, in the way of a potential invader, or to expand up to defensible choke points like mountain ranges rather than its open steppe plains. Some will then argue that Russia obviously enjoys the right to security, and as a result, these are legitimate defensive security interests. Personally, I would like to humbly suggest that that argument is bullshit. For one, no country on Earth is entitled to defensible frontiers. Just ask the Poles or the Ukrainians or any citizen of any country in Africa whose borders were essentially drawn as a straight line by a former colonial power. And giving Russia defensible frontiers would mean Russia ruling over or influencing a huge foreign population. Those countries, like Poland and Ukraine, also themselves enjoy a right to self-defense and sovereignty. And there's no principled reason that their right to exist should be sacrificed in order to make Russians feel a little bit safer. But that's like saying that that no one has a right to to not to be dominated. Like who cares? Yes, all of us understand that it comes down to force and everything else is words on paper and special pleading. But yeah, whatever. Especially since I would argue Russia was one of the least likely countries on planet Earth to be invaded by a foreign power. The Russians will often argue that there was a threat that NATO would attack Russia. My question essentially 
is how on earth would that force ever be collectively mobilized and convinced that, guys, it is time to invade Russia? And here's the kicker. Even if it did decide to invade Russia, would having additional geographical boundaries really help? Because Okay. I mean, yes, so I'm sorry. <laughs> like, additional geographic boundaries would not help. Why the fuck does America have two oceans to defend itself? Like, yeah, you want that. Why do you want, like, nice mountainous regions as a good territory for defense? Like, why is it... Like, this is geographic uh, defensive positions that you want to enjoy. Like, why is it that you enjoy surrounded by mountains that the Swiss have no problem destroying bridges if it ever came to the subject of an invasion? Like, th that's just... Oh, <laughs> why wouldn't it? Like, that's it's a dumb question, and it just makes it's, me... It's stupid. Oh. And it's uh, you'll, you you can also see uh, the way in which he willfully uh, uh, pretends, in my view, uh, that the only dimension of uh, war uh, domination and extension of power over one's native dominions that we should be considering here is the mobilization of a military force. You know, from Clausewitz, you know, politics by other means to uh, to the, the the idea of total war or unrestricted warfare that you see with the uh, some of the Chinese uh, publications based on uh, Sun Tzu and the rest. Like, th the kinetic dimension of all of this uh, is, is just one of them. And so, you know, I could easily uh, lay out a, a scenario, and I think it would reflect reflect in a number of uh, reality in a, num in a number of ways. I could easily lay out a scenario where you're like, no, they're dominating us uh, economically uh, and in terms of information war warfare, uh, and financial uh, transactions and, uh, you know, uh, telecom and uh, culture and uh, entertainment uh, and video games. And they're just advancing across uh, areas that are within our domain um, or historically have been, including our own uh, native territories. Uh, and the only response we have is one that is a kinetic one in the face of these other manipulations. So the way in which he just sort of parcels out the kinetic aspect as being the only threat that should concern Russia um, is it, it's 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 disingenuous. Right, exactly. And he, you know, he talks about the uh, sort of Russia dominating, you know, Poland or whatever, as if you know the United States isn't doing that now, right? And or, or was doing that in Ukraine, uh, especially after 2014. And I'm not even saying that you know, the United States shouldn't, you know, aggressively leverage its diplomacy and cultural influence and whatever to, you know, expand its defensive network. That's not what I'm saying. The point is there has to be a realist line about how far you should try and, you know, assert your imperial interests into the uh, imperial interest of another empire and the u.s has gone way beyond the reasonable limits on that to now provoking uh you know a full-scale war with the other power which is you know what you want to avoid because ultimately it involves the the death of hundreds of thousands of people which is not good um and then of course you know jumping off what you said he expands you know he, he sort of takes this to the ultimate conclusion where it's like look it's just nukes any any war is going to go nuclear so basically russia should just give up russia should just not worry about all this stuff because you know it's just going to go nuclear so you don't have to worry about the giant polish military and you know it's, it sort of takes this nato is always the good guys outlook like nato didn't do nothing nato would never hurt russia who cares if nato is you know a, is bringing in all of the former russian imperial territories into its own military uh you know quote unquote defensive alliance just you know you have to just trust that we're the good guys and you know we would never hurt you basically so let's let him continue into the the nukes because while having a buffer zone in the former warsaw pact or soviet states might have made sense as a defensive strategy against Napoleon or in the Second World War, nuclear weapons now exist. If there is a war of annihilation against Russia, it will be a nuclear conflict, either because the attacker deploys the weapons or because the Russians do. And I've always struggled to understand why a country with the world's largest declared stockpile of nuclear warheads feels itself at threat of a conventional invasion. Because if NATO tanks were rolling towards Moscow, I expect the Russian reaction would be to deploy tactical nuclear weapons against those tanks. And given that the invading force isn't, you know, fighting on the Russian border, but is instead miles from Moscow, you expect that most of the neutral powers of the world would look at that nuclear employment and go, yeah, fair play. 
This is the reason that former Russian Defense Minister Igor Sergeyev put forward the idea that resources should first be diverted towards Russia's nuclear deterrent. Because even if Russia was outmatched in conventional arms by the NATO alliance, the nuclear weapons could keep the Russian homeland safe. So to me, any Russian doctrinal objective to annex or dominate surrounding countries is the result of something other than a legitimate defensive strategic interest. It's not something that can be legitimately called self-defense. Okay, so yeah, he just made the point there that basically because Russia has nukes, you know, they should be willing to tolerate literally anything else that happens on their borders. Yeah, and he also totally leaves out the whole thing about um, uh, time to respond to uh, a nuclear strike, uh, you know, given given the, the placement of nuclear capable uh, missile weapons in countries like Poland and the rest as they move closer and closer to Russia, you've got the whole thing of, well, we just came, we just shifted from having uh, 15 minutes to figure out how to respond to an incoming missile attack that might be nuclear. Um, we've just shifted that to, I don't know, two and a half minutes to make a decision at a national level, whether to enter, uh, you know, nuclear conflict. I mean, th this is just, th this, and this is an area where Perun obviously has uh, uh, some sort of background and education given all of his, his other uh, videos he's produced, obviously knows something about military doctrine and the rest. My guess is that he's a Ukrainian or Polish uh, descent person in, uh, in uh, Australia with a military background, but just a guess, but he's got a, 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 a snotty staff officer kind of vibe and his personal investment in what's going on here suggests that he has Ukrainian or Polish background. Um, but we know uh, in any case, that he has a background with military doctrine and all the rest that he displays with every video. And we're supposed to imagine that he just, it just slipped past him. He just forgot about the, the whole aspect of response time. Right. He's telling us that the geographical boundaries don't matter because of nukes, basically. But I mean, this was a huge sticking point during the Cold War that almost resulted in nuclear war was the stationing of intermediate range ballistic missile missiles in Europe and then missiles in Turkey and also in Cuba. So obviously it matters. And, you know, we've all seen the movies where, you know, the president or whatever is having to make a decision on whether or not to fire the nukes. And it puts you in a hell of a lot more dangerous situation when the opposing party only has two minutes to decide. Um, you know, at that point, it's a lot more difficult to determine if, uh, you know, maybe something has gone wrong in your early warning detection system. So yes, the geographical boundaries absolutely do matter. NATO expansion was a threat to Russian influence, not to Russian survival. But whatever the moral worth of those goals, let's take them as a given for helping to inform Russian strategy. They want to dominate the post-Soviet space. As an extension of that, they want to weaken NATO influence and hold its expansion. They want to weaken American dominance in the unipolar world order, and they want to improve the strategic balance to better favor Russia. There are also strategic goals that they have enumerated in relation to Ukraine, but we'll get to those in just a moment. So now so that we have some just idea of what Russian strategic objectives So he's just basically outlining Russia's strategy in a realistic sense. Like I'm looking at this value free, because if I were someone, if I were a think tank guy or a white shirt white collar person working in, in in washington at the national security administration or whatever i would be drafting up similar documents how do i cripple russia what are their weaknesses who are they aligned with what is their geography like what do they want um but because this this comes down to what i really do think comes down to some sort of uh like an like an like a an epistemological problem like do you find russia to be a fundamentally evil people. Um, and if you find Russia to be fundamentally evil in the same way that, for instance, uh, I don't know, Osama bin Laden finds America to be part of the great Satan, then uh, that's going to, to formulate it here. But I, I look at this from, say, like the lens of Morgenthau or Waltz or Mearsheimer, and I'm just seeing, okay, that seems to be a, a reasonable foreign policy for a, a nation state that has recently had its hegemony severely weakened by the collapse of a previous regime and wants to like knock back the power of the stronger player. Like, okay, cool. Um, what's next? Like, cause everything I'm just getting here just feels like arguments for why they shouldn't be allowed to have agency. And if that's the case, I could just read Stoltenberg tweets or Michael McFall's Twitter account. 
<laughs> um, okay, so I might jump a little more ahead here to pass the Crimea stuff and to the last chance. Did anyone have anything in the Crimea section they wanted to bring up? Not particularly. Cool. Let's uh, integrity. Go but I'd argue even the annexation of Crimea probably wasn't enough to guarantee the strategic disaster that we now see. Russia had lost influence, but it had gained territory, and war wasn't yet inevitable. In yeah, so that whole section was basically about how Crimea cost Russia a lot in its international standing. You know, in terms of not, you know, sanctions were now being deployed against it as you know part of an economic war and all of that. So he, he's sort of arguing that the 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 annexation of Crimea kind of had its ups and downs, but they could have turned it into a win, but ultimately it turns into an, a loss because of, you know, the subsequent events he's about to describe. And January did, of 2022. Did, I can't remember. Did he cover anything in his earlier historical stuff? I, I would assume he doesn't because I don't think he's an honest actor. Again, just speculation. But we've got the Crimean War, right? And the idea of the extension of uh, English and French, and even at that point, uh, Turkish naval power into the Black Sea, and the the importance of uh, Crimea as, uh, as the, the naval base for the Russian Black Sea fleet, right? So, so he, he just talks about um, Crimea being taken, and he just describes it as a as something that just costs uh, Russia again, and they've lost, they've lost, they've lost, they've lost already. Their the whole, the whole grand strategy is ridiculous. It's already a strategic failure. Well, what, what, why did we? What, why did France and uh, England and uh, Turkey want to impose themselves uh, navally upon? Uh, Russia back in 1854 or whatever it was, right? And and wh why would you discuss the grand strategy here and the issue of Crimea and not bring that up and draw the historical parallels? Because it makes it quite clear that it is a a, a matter of uh, of um, a loss of uh, one's borders, boundaries, and sphere of influence. And you could safely argue that uh, Russia. Uh, historically has uh, dominated the northern half of the Black Sea. So if they, they cede that area to uh, naval powers, you know, then they're, they're going to be pushed back even further and they're going to um, be bottled up and contained even more than they already are by the Bosphorus uh, and the Dardanelles. So they just talk about how Russia is actually losing by doing this when in fact uh, history shows us quite explicitly that this is a critical aspect of uh of Russia maintaining access to that sea and th th from there to things like it's a uh, it's a uh, base uh, in uh, in uh, bases air and naval bases in Syria and its ability to do anything in the Mediterranean. Yeah, and of course, if you're if you're acquiring territory, you can't really call that a strategic failure. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid, uh, but all but that territory in particular. Uh, I mean, the the Crimean Peninsula is so ridiculously important to Russia. It's hard to overstate it. We should also point out that Crimeans aren't Ukrainians, and Crimea was never part of Ukraine until Khrushchev, a Ukrainian himself, just gifted the territory to the SSR of Ukraine, um, which is actually argued was an illegal move because it was never approved by the Soviet Parliament. And the the, the Soviets did actually have a real government and. Not not, you know, a sort of a Hitlerian dictatorship, uh, exactly. Um, so, you know, that's a solid point to, on their part to some extent that, you know, the Crimea should never have been uh, kept as part of Ukraine anyway, because it was play given illegally there in the first place. That's their argument. I mean, you can view that however you want, but uh, it's easy to understand why Russia would sort of view uh, Crimea belonging to Ukraine is just entirely Ill illegitimate. And that's on top of like the um, unbelievable the real politic. Yeah, the real politic of it. I mean, if there's any if there's anything that the um, you know United States could have done to avoid all of this is to make that fairly reasonable concession that okay, you can have Crimea because uh, to not do that is to basically put the Russians up against the wall and say you're you're not going to be allowed to trade um, anywhere in the war. Why are there F's going on in chat? 
thing. <laughs> ra- ra- rage, raging mandrels. <laughs> and you press F for uh, Prussia. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. All right. Let's let's continue. And war wasn't yet inevitable. In January of 2022, I'd in fact argue that Russia was in a pretty good position strategically. Russian economic relevance in Europe was very real. Nord Stream 2 was going to come online, which would only increase Russian economic influence over Germany. The Russian military was greatly feared. There were a lot of articles coming out in think tanks basically saying that Russia could take Ukraine if they wanted. Meanwhile, in Ukraine itself, the Zelensky government was incredibly unpopular, as was the ongoing grinding war in the Donbass. Russian information campaigns in Europe and the United States were bearing fruit. And as we'll see later, positive opinions of Russia in many particularly right-wing parties in Europe were quite high. And as for the chances of Ukraine joining NATO at any point in the near future, well, those sat between zero and none. Countries can't join... So he, he makes this point a lot. I think the deal with Ukraine being in NATO or not is kind of irrelevant. Like, you can say that, you know, Ukraine joining NATO wasn't going to happen, and it's obviously not going to happen now. And he, he also brings up the fact that Ukraine was disqualified because they had a territorial dispute after 2014 with Crimea. But the, the deal is it doesn't really matter if Ukraine is in NATO for... Dropped out there, Charlemagne. I don't know if anyone else can hear you. No, you yeah, out. yeah I, I noticed that, but I think I'm back now. Um, but yeah, I did, did, didn't hear everything you said though. Ukraine, the last whether, point about whether, whether or not it's important, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're getting all the military aid they need now anyway, and they were being culturally, uh, you know, taken into the European or U.S. sphere of influence. So, does it really his his point about Ukraine wasn't going to join NATO isn't really the knockout that he's trying to um, pawn it off as. Yeah, they're, uh, Ukraine isn't in NATO right now, and it's be, being supported by every NATO country and beyond uh, with uh, with everything from uh, from uh, tanks uh, the, uh, and uh, and we're we're told uh, up you know F sixteens with some modernization packages to cruise missiles from Britain and France. I mean, what the fuck. Um, and also the claim that 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 Ukraine wasn't going to be going into NATO as of whatever this period is. I guess he's saying in 2022, right? Because the war, I'm not sure what that time period is, but the, the, the idea that Ukraine wasn't going to go into NATO is just a lie. Obviously, it was going to. It was going to happen. I mean, wh- wh- why are we supposed to imagine that, you know, Ukrainian membership, as he says here in NATO, was not a real possibility uh, in the near or medium term? Who says? Sounds like total what a- bullshit to me. The whole issue with Crimea could have been unilaterally resolved anyway, because the issue was Ukraine is, can't join NATO because of a territorial dispute over Crimea. OK, cede the territory and the dispute join NATO. Duh. I mean. Mandrel. Yeah, and and what we're seeing now that they're talking about fast tracking, you know, Ukraine into NATO now when it is at war, and they're talking about giving it security guarantees beyond. I, I mean, it's all it's all just just rearranging of little uh, you know, splotches of ink right. on paper. This, it's all this nonsense. is just this is just stupid. This this whole Ukraine was never going to join NATO thing. This and and just, Russia this. screwed up because because they weren't going to join NATO, but Russia screwed up by acting, which actually made it so they did join NATO. So it was Russia shooting itself in the foot. The, the, the fact here is it's just proof that uh, U- Ukraine was always headed towards NATO and uh, and and Russia had to act. You know, it's it's all how you turned it in, in the light. And I believe he does so here in a dis, dishonest and disingenuous way. Join NATO while they have active territorial disputes, and Ukraine had two, the Donbass and Crimea. And even if an attempt had been made to bring Ukraine into NATO despite those territorial disputes, can you ever imagine someone like Viktor Orban signing off on Ukrainian membership under those circumstances? So Ukraine was not about to join NATO. Its it's government was unpopular and potentially unstable. The Russian economy was projected to grow rapidly and its military was continuing to modernize. And while it's hard to speak with absolute confidence over hypotheticals, can you imagine if Russia had not invaded after America had screamed at the top of its lungs that it was going to do so? Like, it, this is a stupid point too. Like, they would have made America look bad. Like, America was saying they're going to invade. 
But then if they didn't, that would have been 40 chess because then America would look bad. I mean, come on. The Americans would have been made to look like a bunch of alarmists desperately out to mobilize the world against Russia that wasn't actually being aggressive. It would have gone further to weakening NATO unity that was already arguably at something of a historical low ebb. If you're looking for a clear and present danger to Russian security, you'll have to help me out here because I can't see one. Putin could have waited it out, continued to play the information game, made the Americans look like a bunch no. of alarmists, and try <laughs> to rebuild inf- no, and, and and the reason why I say no is, oh, well, he could have played the long game and like, no, 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 no. That's okay. the game that was being played and he was losing. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and of course, he already is is like under the, under the eye of Sauron because of uh, of of Georgia and, and the events that happened there in 2008. And he's and and in Crimea and Donbass in 2014. So, and Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan and Armenia, yeah, yeah, like he's already under the microscope. So, like th- the idea that he should just like wait it out and and like you know not use force is stupid. wait it's wait just- wait it out when the o- o- uh, what is it organization or organization for security and cooperation in Europe or whatever I believe those were the ones Prude doubtless will know that did uh, the the independent uh, figures on the number of casualties in the Donbass area. And it was like 14,000 or something. And there was yeah. a huge spike in shelling of the Donbass and accu- uh, accumulation of uh, Ukrainian troops as well at that time to push this. Yeah, let's just wait it out as uh, the huge military that uh, Ukraine has set up uh, is uh, in a position to uh, retake uh, these breakaway areas. Let's just wait it out. And obviously, he would have been stronger if uh, if all of the uh, separatists had been snuffed out by uh, invading uh, Western Ukrainian forces. Yeah, he would have been stronger. Obviously, what a what a what a dumbass! What what an L. Yeah, I was looking for. Uh, I'm scrolling through my blogs now, but I, I highlighted those statistics about the increased shelling right before the war started and also the massive increase in uh, ukraine's military buildup yeah actually i have it right here let me switch to another tab really quick uh showing ukraine's military buildup so i probably have to stop share and then share the other tab let's see um yeah here we go so this is taken from uh Oh, I forget the name of the publication. It doesn't matter. It's reliable data. So Ukraine, uh, you know, basically has like a pitiful defense budget uh, back before 2014. And then it's just going up. This is being, this is uh, coming from Western aid as well. Uh, so Ukraine was doing a military buildup. He's actually right to say that uh, they could have defeated uh, Ukraine in 2014. Uh, He said that earlier. The problem was that Russia economically was not in a position to actually survive that yet. Um, So they couldn't invade in 2014 and not come out with the the strategic disaster he's basically describing. Um, But then Ukraine was doing this military buildup, right? And then they, uh, it seemed like they were preparing to actually retake these territories because they had basically... um, they possibly had even indicated that it was happening imminently uh, with the shelling that was happening uh, a week before Russia actually invaded, which, you know, perhaps, you know, in a hundred years, we might know if it was a sort of preemptive strike or something, you know, or maybe we'll never know. But uh, basically it was inevitable that those territories were going to be taken back. Um, and and anyway. there's that whole business with uh, Ukraine under Promethean doctrine, you know, Pilsudski stuff. Um, has to be understood as part of a set with Poland. And immediately after they did the color revolution, I mean, just just the the most blatant, outrageous color revolution bullshit uh, in 2014, um, they uh, they went uh, pushing uh, Duda and uh, and, you know, uh, Polish uh, nationalist parties and massive investment in uh, the Polish military as well and uh, all sorts of economic support and uh, and the rest in uh, Poland. So it's not like Russia was just looking at this happening in uh, in Ukraine, though, of course, it mattered more uh, being closer and all the rest. It mattered more to uh, Russia uh, in terms of uh, Ukraine itself, but it was happening in Poland, too. And there's also, you know, I mentioned uh, I mentioned Kazakhstan and the way they're chiseled at in Georgia uh, and the way or South Ossetia 
Abkhazia, um, the way they've chiseled that in Kazakhstan um, and other places. Um, but I didn't mention Belarus. There were at least two, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, two attempted coups uh, or, or color revolutions in Belarus as well. Um, so, so this isn't just Ukraine, you know, he's, he's choosing to put the spotlight here, uh, again, disingenuously when you have to look at the entire picture of Russian relationships with, uh, territories outside its immediate control, uh, as Belarus was at the time, um, you, you have to look at it all at once in order to get a clear picture and he's not giving you one. So we have, a uh, Marcus Furious Pertnax joining us, uh, finally, welcome. And, uh, I will, uh. I'll play the next, uh, I'll let this section finish up and that will uh, hopefully tee you off and get you uh, into the mood to, uh, you know, go into a soliloquy uh, on the topic. Indeed. Uh, and and uh, my apologies to everyone on the panel and our viewers. Um, no yeah. problem. It's, uh, it's early you. for you. You know, you're, you're a hardworking farmer. You need your rest. It's fine. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, it, yes, Mandrill, I have confused the, I've caused confusion delay. My, my, my apologies, but no, I'll, I'll get on the, I'll, I'll catch on to the gist of this quick. So just keep pushing on Charlie and I'll uh, chime in for I can. Ukraine over time. Instead, it was time for the good old classic mistake number four, overextension and overreach. Convinced that the Western powers would do nothing, convinced that the Ukrainian government would fold, convinced that his military was one of the greatest in the world and capable of doing the job that he had set before it. Putin sent in the tanks. Which brings us finally to the question of how did the invasion play out and was it a strategic success? I know you've probably figured out my answer by now, but hear me out anyway. Boy, the answer, of course, is it was a complete bloody train wreck. The Russian army first bogged down and then lost much of the territory it had taken to Ukraine over the course of 2022. Visually confirmed losses were mind-bendingly heavy and they were driven by some of those same old mistakes we discussed earlier. A failure to reform government and society meant that once again, corruption and lies came into play. Corruption had weakened the Russian military and a culture of deception and lies meant that Putin had an unrealistic image of how Ukraine would respond and how capable his own forces were. Meanwhile, Russian rhetoric and attitudes helped drive Ukrainian resistance. There was a lot of feeling of brotherhood at one point between Ukrainians and Russians. But Putin's rhetoric denied Ukrainian nationality. It denied Ukraine's historical existence. It denied its culture. It essentially cast Ukraine not in the role of a brotherly nation, but essentially as misguided mini Russians. So uh, that part there is particularly uh, egregious because that, to the extent that Ukraine's existence is being denied, that's a response to the opposite happening within Ukraine. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, hardcore Ukrainian nationalism emerging as really the only uh, ideological force uh, in Ukrainian politics, because Ukrainian, Ukraine obviously has the same, actually, I would say much worse corruption problems uh, than uh, does Russia. So again, he's just, he's sort of, he's just leaving out the other side of the picture, uh, where he's acting like, you know, Russia is just in this sort of one-sided imperialistic way, denying that Ukraine exists, which... I don't, I would not even say that's an accurate summary of what Russia is doing, uh, but it is a response to uh, that being done to the Russians in, in, you know, those parts of Ukraine, as we saw on the map that voted more in favor of staying in the Soviet Union. And that approach went down about as well as Russification of Poland or Finland did in the far past. Finally, also, he doesn't mention there that uh, huh, it's, it's weird that he left out the Soviet policy of Ukrainization in Ukraine um, and, uh, you know, the, the essentially ethnic cleansing of, of Russians. But, you know, weird. In just about every aspect of the invasion, the idea that a country the size of Ukraine could be invaded by the Russian military under strength pre-mobilization and somehow take the city of Kiev while also attacking in the Donbass, the northeast and the south all at the same time, well, it was the very definition of overextension and overreach. The Russian military had been given a task that was beyond its resources and it was about to be punished for it. But in the early... All right, so, yeah, Russian military sucks. Um, you know, that's we've, we've heard all that before. Uh, I think we can skip a little bit ahead into where he's actually talking about what Putin is trying to do. Locked in. 
Of course, that's a pretty big claim to make, and whether or not you think Russia has suffered a strategic defeat depends a lot on what you think its strategic goals were. If the goal was to stimulate the Ukrainian scrap metal industry or provide a stimulus package for the US military industrial complex, then obviously the invasion has been a tremendous success. But it's probably fairer to assess success or failure through the lens of Russia's own strategic objectives. We talked about the Primakov Doctrine before and its objectives, so let's apply them here. The invasion should undermine US power, influence, and hegemony, it should advance Russian domination of the post-Soviet space, and it should weaken or resist NATO and NATO expansion. Well okay, so basically this is the point where he's actually defining the purpose of the war. He's basically saying the purpose of the war is to weaken the US. To me, this is just completely ass backwards. The purpose of the war <laughs> is to take control of the territories adjacent to the Black Sea, and especially secure... Uh, Russian control over Crimea. Uh, and I think this is sort of the actually the big problem with this video is he is applying this completely different set of strategic goals to the war itself. It's not that Russia doesn't have the goal of undermining U.S. power. And you know, it literally has undermined that power in the territories that it has taken under its control. But he's sort of just asserting his own definition of what Russia is trying to do and then declaring that they have failed at it when... And, and sort of just ignore, ign completely ignoring like the war itself and what the actual goals of the war are. Also, there's a bit of classic conversion here, Charlie, um, insofar that I'd say you know, you've rightly outlined, I mean, just in the time I've been on the panel, but I mean, we've discussed this several times already together, the two of us and amongst others on this panel, as to what Russia's object uh, objectives were regarding the war and also what its strategic concerns were prior to the war breaking out. Um, what's what Perun here is doing is you know, uh, definitely some inversion whereby if you consider the fact that many or well, the majority of NATO countries have quite literally emptied their arsenals to try and supply Ukraine in a desperate attempt to stem Russian uh, the Russians achieving their objectives in Ukraine it's actually the opposite it is NATO having used this opportunity of a hot war between Ukraine and Russia to weaken Ukrainian forces. And they have stated that time and time and time again. I mean, you've even had people such as, you know, um, Millie and Kirby in the USA stating that, you know, oh, Russia has you know failed tactically, operationally and strategically. And, you know, we are doing X, Y, Z to try and weaken Russian um, efforts and uh, the Russian armed forces. They have stated that much clearly in public. Um, it is the NATO... In, in, um, uh, assistance packages to, to Ukraine that have had the intent of weakening Russia, not the other way around. Uh, the other thing I want to add here is, is that like we're going back to these objectives of this doctrine, which really does get fleshed out in the, the 1990s. I mean, Primakov was made foreign minister in 1996. Um, and I mean, this is what gets what's listed out here is that the doctrine is, is listed in, in the late 1990s. You don't think grand strategy changes in the midst of changing hegemonic and material conditions that happen on the world stage, the state of your economy, the state of military um, positions abroad? Uh, you know, I just we're going to apply a 30 year old doctrine and then we're going to apply it here. This is like saying that the United States still operates under shock and awe when providing military assistance to the Ukrainians. Um, it just it seems to be a very thin level of analysis here saying this one guy's doctrine is what holds all things together and then we're going to change things. This is like saying Biden is operating under the Wolfowitz doctrine. It just doesn't hold up very well, in my opinion. Yeah, and again, that's kind of the point here is that for all his expertise in logistics, this Perun does not understand the grand strategy aspect at all. We'll also add to that the objectives that Putin himself put forward to the Russian public and to the world. Initially, this was the demilitarization of Ukraine and the removal of ultranationalist elements, followed a couple of months later by a declaration that this totally not a land grab war was in fact for the purpose of seizing control of four regions of Ukraine. And so it's those goals, the goals of the Primakov Doctrine and the ones that Putin put forward to the public and the world, that I want to judge the Russian invasion against because no matter which one you look at, the answer isn't pretty. Now, in making that statement, I want to be clear about one thing. I don't know how this war is going to end. At time of recording, Edric. Russia is still attacking on multiple fronts and has significant military resources. Western support is uncertain, but also critical determining how far Ukraine is able to go in the future and how this war plays out. 
But my point essentially is that from the Russian strategic perspective, it almost doesn't matter. In order to prove that point, let's embark on a little bit of a thought experiment. And with great apologies to my listeners from Ukraine, let's imagine for a moment that Russia wins, that Russia achieves everything that it says it has set out to achieve. Uh, In 2024, Tucker Carlson is elected president of the United States. Western support for Ukraine drops away. (laughs) And after a grinding military campaign, eventually Russia is able to take full control of Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. Well, he acts like that's crazy, but it's completely feasible that that could happen. I don't know if it would happen in 2024, but it's not crazy to imagine that Russia could take control of all four of these oblasts. Uh, uh, also, keep in mind, his idea of a Russian win condition is some right-wing, evil Tucker Carlson POTUS 24 victory. Just, ugh. Well, it's just little quips like that that kind of show the... that you, It's sort of like lifting the... Uh, uh, what's the analogy I'm looking for, or the metaphor I'm looking for? It's you're peeking under the this sort of like frame he has, where look how of neutrality, uh, yeah. exactly. But it's he he lets slip sometimes these little things like that, where you know it sort of really shows you what's under the hood here. Without yeah. Western support and pressured by, yeah, you want to jump on that? Just it, it's a very Reddit vibe, but yeah, no, yeah. it's very Reddit. <laughs> like here's the I thing, mean, like a legit his voice complaint is Reddit, for God's sake. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, like, a legit complaint that you could definitely levy against, like, the Russians and the Ukrainians would be that Belarusian uh, border dispute with Poland um, right before, like, the last 2021, the fall of 21, where it was about migrants. Like, migrants as a mechanism of political disruption and weakening political power, that's a legitimate claim that you could say is an offensive tool. That's, like, I, I would argue that that's a legitimate thing that you could lay claim on. But that's not uh, being discussed here. I was um, going to say, just um, Erdogan does that expertly, for instance. Oh, I know. Er- Erdogan's probably one of the best at us, but I mean, so is yeah, just, yeah. so does Lukashenko. Um, but again, that notice how that doesn't get discussed in these sort of um, in, in this discussion about Russia and, and fighting against the West. I just feel like that that's a legit complaint that could get raised, but that I feel like underpins the the lefty shibboleth over, you know, migrants. Good. By Sorry, Russian I just needed to get that tangent out there. No, it's good. Signs a treaty which commits it to never joining NATO and becoming a neutral in inverted commas state. Somehow, Russia convinces countries around the world to recognize the annexation of these additional regions, which is something not even most Russian allies have done. But let, let's hand wave it away and assume that everyone from France to the People's Republic of China recognizes Kherson as part of the Russian Federation. I mean, I don't really even oh. see why that would have to happen because. Like, what happens if Russia doesn't convince China that these regions aren't, like, you know, uh, does it matter? I mean, Russia's still trading with all these partners. I don't, like... It's kind of a fait accompli anyway, right? Like... Uh, also, you, you have to just listen to what, what the way he's saying. Oh, the inverted comma, state, right? Oh, if, if Ukraine loses these four oblasts, it's no longer a state, right? Thus implying... That oh Ukraine is only a state as long as it it retains its full and absolute territorial maximal um, territorial claims basically, which is interesting. Which is I mean which is what it has. I mean Ukraine is at a historic maximum, but you know as we know, um, after the end of history happened, like the lines on the map never cha- can't change. If you change the lines on the map, you're Hitler. In this dream scenario. How has Russia gone against its core strategic objectives? To deal first with the idea of halting NATO expansion and weakening the NATO alliance. And in this respect, I'd argue the Russian campaign has already been a colossal failure. Yeah, yeah, I know we got uh, Finland and Sweden uh, joining now. It's, um, or, uh, sorry, Norway and Sweden joining. So it's just, uh, it's over. If Jens Stoltenberg could get away with... Oh, no, that is Finland, isn't it? Yeah giving Putin a medal for being NATO recruiter of the year, I think he'd bloody well do it. It just brings home the point that if your goal is to... That, that actually is kind of bad for Russia, Finland joining NATO, but I mean, it's... Uh, I don't know, what, what is the argument here? Just there's, let there's let, the negative let, though, right? let anything yeah. let anything goes in Ukraine, because if you attack, like, Finland might join NATO. I mean, that's definitely not... And, and it also assumes that this, this wasn't on the... Like this whole idea, it, we've got we've got d- d- decades of NATO expansion, of aggressive NATO expansion, and it wouldn't have continued in uh, in Finland and Sweden 
uh, if uh, if it if if, uh, if Russia hadn't gone into Ukraine. I, I mean, this this whole idea that there's a homeostasis and that the the NATO membership somehow wouldn't have shifted in the direction it did here, and that that uh, Russia precipitated it. It's it's all it's it, these are presumptions and unconvincing well, ones. Also, let's just imagine. Uh, okay, Finland's not in NATO, and Russia attacks Finland. You go, oh, okay. Well, they're not in NATO. I guess NATO just totally stays out of it, right? Like in some sense, this is just a formalization of more or less the situation that already would have existed anyway. To so try also, and break up a yeah. Sorry, Charlie. Just to say, and also for the for the Russians, like you know, put this way, there's a there's an argument both ways as a positive and a ne negative strategically speaking but what this does actually do for the russians it does actually clear strategic ambiguity regarding yes, uh, the baltic and the, and the finnish front like in the end instead of the russians thinking oh well what are the nordic countries going to do now they are firmly in one camp and you know russian high command can plan accordingly rather than actually having to do with an amb amb ambiguous situation so uh, i i would i would consider that something of a uh you know, if, if I was a Russian general, I'd think, okay, now I actually know the condition of this rather than being left in, you know, questioning it. Security alliance in Europe. The worst bloody way to go about it is by starting a conventional war in Europe and making everyone really nervous. As a result of the war in Ukraine, three things are happening to NATO. It's enlarging with the applications of Sweden and Finland. It's remilitarizing in the sense that all of its member states are now pouring resources steadily into rebuilding their armed forces. I mean, I have seen the argument that Russia is somehow demilitarizing NATO by destroying its equipment in Ukraine, but that doesn't pass the pub test. NATO countries are gearing up to produce replacement equipment at record levels and at levels the Russian economy, given its size, simply can't match long term. And even if that weren't the case, the idea of demilitarizing your opponent by face tanking their ammunition reserves with your infantry and armored vehicles isn't exactly a 4D chess move. And another... Uh, yeah. You can no. see from the audio, he actually added that in as an edit after. Yeah, that's. I, I'm just going to say uh, uh, that's a hard no. Um, and the reason that I say that's a hard no is because um, just look at uh, Western equipment. Look at the numbers and, and the production levels that they actually have. Sure, they're increasing, um, but are they actually going to be prepared? No. No, the, the the United States could possibly be prepared, maybe, but NATO as a whole, the European powers within NATO, are they prepared for a conflict on a conventional scale with Russia? No, like they're, they're just not. They have 600 tanks to put together, all of them combined. So you're just, no. <laughs> it just, just to buttress what Mandrel's saying here, I mean, Mandrel, you, you may agree or disagree, but it could be said that at this point in time, NATO has never been in a position uh, more unprepared to face off against a conventional enemy. Oh, I'd agree say. with that. I would agree yeah. with that, absolutely. Yeah. In terms of and, total numbers, ab absolutely. Yeah. And in terms of even things like munitions and, and um, you know, artillery shells and that sort of stuff. I was actually having this conversation only yesterday, um, you know, with someone in my own circle. And I, I made, the, made the reference, because I think Charlie and I, we might have mentioned this uh, last time we spoke about it, um, perhaps on UO, I can't remember Charlie, but... Uh, that the French were sort of boasting that they had doubled ammunition production so that they were manufacturing uh, 9,000 shells. And I can't actually remember if it was a week or a month. I forget what the time scale was. Um, but they doubled it from 4,500 to 9,000. Um, that's not even what the Ukrainians are using in a day. And that's not even a third of what the Russians are using a day. So the fact that they're boasting these increased numbers of production that even to this point don't fulfill minimum re requirements is, a, is hardly a win. For, for these people and also um you know we, we've seen yes okay maybe the american military industrial complex can you know pump out javelins and bradleys and this sort of stuff but the fact is these major weapon systems you know things like the uh uh take for example the german panzer halberds uh, the their big sort of howitzer self-propelled howitzer system you know they can only make so many of them you know per year you know the uh they can only make so many uh leopard twos per year in fact the germans uh i think the firm that makes them is it, is it krupp or tyson krupp i can't remember who makes the uh or rheinmetall maybe i can't remember who actually makes the whole tank it, it's, but, um, i, I want to say it's rheinmetall because they're rheinmetall yeah. is the ones who well, made well, the, the the united states gun um yeah you know, 105 uh, yeah, millimeter gun and, yeah and I, I know yeah i know right rheinmetall make the 105 and 120 mil gun i just can't remember who actually makes the whole tank but anyway whether it's krupp or, or um or, or rheinmetall 
it doesn't matter what what the point i'm making is that they are they are looking to build a second factory in germany i'm sure and they're looking to establish production i believe in poland but i mean they've just announced it <laughs> those factories won't be up and running for at least the you know a, a year or two and it will still take them like another few months to actually tool up and start pumping out tanks and then and this is a cruise like this stuff requires time that people like Perun are simply ignoring and, and of course, we saw that um, not just in the the actual slides that we went over for the the Ukraine offensive leak slides, um, and you can tell because in every single one of these cases, they always choose when they run up against a deadline or when they try to get all of this logistical equipment together that they just they just don't have the spare parts for. They're missing this component or that component. If it takes extra long to you know, th to throw it all together, what do they choose? They choose to abbreviate the training timeline. Every single time these people do it, yeah. like just like that. Mm. And and if one if one takes an, a, a casual look at, say, like the, the end of the Second World War, for instance, where you see um, particularly from from the uh, in the aftermath of, say, uh, Operation Overlord and on the Western Front and Operation Bagration on the Eastern Front, uh, a lot of German armored divisions from that point on have, uh, how, can I put, how can I put this, varied degrees of success on the battlefield simply because their replacements that come in are a lot greener. They're rather less trained and they sort of rely on being integrated with veteran units, you know, with, with a cadre of, of experienced officers to sort of bring them up to speed. But there's a, a replete number of examples where um, there'll be a young, inexperienced crew that come across an inferior allied tank or an or inferior allied unit, but actually lose on the basis that they're just too green and too inexperienced and aren't well trained. A, an armored vehicle is only as good as its crew, irrespective of its technical capabilities. Um, you know, like for instance, you know, there's, a, there's an example, like even I think in the, um, in the rural pocket of 1945 of like a, uh, a, a king, a, a king tiger too, just coming out worse against a handful of Shermans on the basis that the average age of the crew is like twenty-two. <laughs> you know, they're not well trained. You know, it, it's just an example of the fact that th this equipment is only as good as those that use it. Yeah, and the other thing he's ignoring here as well, from an industrial perspective, is yeah, okay, Germany is making a bunch of more stuff and they're putting investments into industry, but how is that going to be affected by shortages uh, in terms of energy? Right. If you assume with heavy industry, you require a, a heavy degree of energy uh, uh, input in order to be able to make those industrial processes run. So if you're, you know, if your petroleum is more expensive because your your you know Nord Stream got kaput and uh, you're importing LNG and you don't have an LNG port, how does how does your fuel situation look? Are, are you going to be able to? Oh, and by the way, you're also your coal plants are, and your nuclear plants are, are getting shut down. So, like, how does that work yeah. for making the steel? How does that work for making, you know, aluminum? How does that work for making all of the the, the tool steel and, and things that you need in order to be able to actually make arm, you know, steel armor mm. plate? Uh, yeah, just the, all the of these little. Port, right? Yeah how do how do you get all of these these logistical. Uh, processes in place and these logistical pipelines really in place so that you can just start pumping things out exactly, exactly just, right it now. doesn't make sense you gotta think yeah, exactly and you gotta think with the way that they're you know um shall i say climbing the vice on our living standards in the west you know and, and i mean not not to deviate this conversation in a totally different direction but like you know with our our green environmental renewable policies right where sort of we're building um you know solar farms and and wind farms like to, in, in this sort of um half half-witted attempt to sort of you know green the economy meanwhile none of that is any sufficient base for electricity just like actually run industrialized economy never mind a military industrial complex which is even more energy intensive right all these things just don't add up um so it's a very good point that you raise just very quickly before we move on i just want to answer um uh, Minoan and Ludwig uh, Mariendorf. Uh, yes, I did mention Tyson Krupp. And yes, Tyson Krupp, uh, they joined after the end of the Second World War because Tyson and Krupp were two separate companies and they're one of the large, largest industrial firms in Germany today. So yes, they still exist. They weren't destroyed after World War II. Sorry, um, continue, Charlie. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm going to hit play, but before I do, I'll make the final point. Even if we just accept all this at face value, and these are probably his best points, um, 
what it's not being uh compared to the alternative so it's like russia it invades U- ukraine and then all this happens but what is the alternative the alternative from their perspective is to not fight and just lose completely so yes fighting resulted in all of this but what's the alternative here thing the Russian invasion has done is given NATO a renewed sense of purpose and a surge in public popularity. NATO skepticism was a real phenomenon, both in the United States and in some countries in Europe. But for some reason, the sight of a non-NATO European country being attacked by the Russian Federation seems to have motivated everyone else to group up a little bit tighter and to build more guns. In terms of the net impact on the conventional military balance between NATO and Russia, I would argue that on this basis alone, even a Russian victory in Ukraine would be a strategic defeat. I mean, that, that's just stupid um, to, to say that on this alone, that a victory for Russia in, in Ukraine still counts as a defeat because like NATO likes itself more now. I mean, what? I mean, like the, the discussion over European defense autonomy had been somewhat serious, especially in the age of Trump, but the oh, people have a higher perception of NATO now. I, I don't think that that would have been the de facto end. But again, it's for for his argumentation, because if I wanted to disrupt NATO, this would be the way to do it. I mean, if you want to disrupt NATO, you constantly pit uh, European nation states uh, about NATO policy, and then you just throw in the Islam bomb into question, like what happened with Turkey, and then that precipitously timed Quran burning that happened in Sweden, um, you know, just those are the things that you would do to undermine it. I think that just because there's a wider public perception in NATO, I don't think that that means that this is a defeat for Russia. But like, that's the claim we're going to make because he's basing all of this on that Primakov doctrine that is um, now nearly 30 years old. And, you know, if I wanted to undermine NATO, th- there are other ways you go about that. And it's all premature anyway, because uh, let's look at what happens in, let's say, in the middle of 2024, not saying it's going to happen, but let's say Russia does take all those territories and has a a compelling case to make for uh, its own victory there. And uh, and the western part of Ukraine is in shambles and all kinds of dirt comes out about what was going on there. And Biden gets uh, prosecuted because of uh, for pushing this war. And, you know, I'm not saying any of these things are going to happen, but they're within the realm of possibility, if not of likelihood. Um, So so what would you say then when NATO shattered and uh, these countries no longer have uh, resources or any kind of public mandate for getting away with crap like this? You know, what would you say then? Also, there's the whole business of uh, of the like flow cark analysis that Jimmy Thomas has done with uh, with the region of Ukraine and uh, the fact that if Ukraine really is a NATO member and NATO forces are stationed there, which presumably would happen if uh, it became a NATO member, it's not just the the nearness of the missiles. Uh, that reduces the response time to make decisions about things like nuclear conflict and basically screws uh, Russia's nuclear deterrent. It's also the fact that once you get past the Dnieper and a few of these little spots where uh, fighting is going on now, you've got a straight shot all the way uh, to to Moscow. You know, well, and we, the, we saw Wagner, Wagner just yeah. threatened this thing that you're talking about, and that was taken very seriously. So to yeah, bolster well, your point, imagine if it was a, a NATO army stationed right, even further North power. than Wagner was. It, 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 was, it wasn't like the, the Wagner troops. And I, as you guys know, I happen to believe that all of that was theater. But um, yes. it's not like they were easy to it was easy for Russia to just close the tunnel at the ring of mountains that defended Moscow. It's not like, you know, Russia could have just, you know, blown the bridges over these giant rivers that make it impossible to approach Moscow. No, once you get past uh, that area of uh, of uh, eastern Ukraine that's being contested now, it's as th- Jimmy Thomas laid out. It's like it's a straight shot until you hit the ring road of Moscow. Just if I can butter a semi for a second um, again, sorry for persistent World War II analogies. Um, but uh, the the Russians have experience with this in so far of having that proximal threat to Moscow specifically. Um, if any of you guys on the panel are familiar with the uh, Rzhev salient, um, which was formed 
Um, so after the Soviets pushed back the Germans from the gates of Moscow, the the you know the winter, the end of forty one, um, after the failure of Operation Typhoon, um, the lines roughly settled. Um, you know, come sort of uh, March April nineteen forty two, the start of nineteen forty two. And uh, around the town that was called Rojev, a salient formed, um, whereby I think approximately 20-something German divisions kind of dug in and held around this town. And if you look at like a, a front map of this area, you know, at any time prior to Battle of Stalingrad, for instance, this, Rojev, this salient sort of re remains intact. The lines are pretty static. But the Soviets launched several offensive operations to try and eliminate this salient, and they're unsuccessful. And the Soviets are repelled with significant losses um, by the Germans that are holding out. But uh, Rzhev was so vital to the Soviets because of its proximity to Moscow that if the Germans wanted to, there would be like their launch pad to launch another offensive in the Moscow direction. And, uh, and it was essentially considered by all planners, both Allied and even German, uh, they refer to it as the uh, the pistol held to Moscow's temple or to Moscow's forehead. Um, so the idea of a large number of experienced, you know, divisions or units that are within strike distance to Moscow is actually something that isn't too far removed from Russian living memory in terms of its high command, so to speak. So it's not a totally alien concept to, to consider. I mean, the newly elected president of the Czech Republic is literally a former general who used to be the chair of the NATO Military Commission. Geez, I wonder what his opinion on NATO and the threat from Russia will be. I'd also argue that closer ties between Ukraine and NATO are more likely now than they were before the invasion. I've already explained... All right, I think we can skip over a lot of this section. Uh, just to turn, this is just talking about, like, Ukraine's more pro-NATO now. Uh, yeah, I wanted to get to protecting the Donbass. This... This is really annoying. And most of the Russian army tied up in Ukraine, Russia's ability to project influence elsewhere has been significantly weakened. That creates an opening, an opening that countries like the United States or the People's Republic of China can move into. That's actually a legitimate concern. If you read Russian materials, they're very worried. They didn't want this war. They're very worried about the fact that China is going to dominate the, the post-American space more than Russia, very much because of this war. Uh, but, you know, the problem is uh, they were, you know, from their perspective, forced into this position, right? Because you you have it coming from both ends for Russia. It's either China or you, and you have uh, America coming in from the West. So they've chosen to try and roll the dice, deal with this problem, and then hopefully come out on top and not have this happen. So this is a legitimate concern, but again, What's the alternative here? The alternative is Ukraine ends up in NATO. Actually, and more importantly, Ukraine ends up in the European Union, is cut out of Russia's economic block that it's trying to build as a counter lever to China because Russia doesn't want to be in relationship to China in the same way it is to America. It wants to have its own economic sphere to at least be an equal, if not dominant player. Uh, so, you know, again, we just we're, you have to be realistic here about the situation it's in. It's like, yes, they're putting themselves in a situation where they could lose to China, but the alternative is just lose to America. Um, anyway, getting in trying to also. win influence in Ukraine, Russia may have lost a significant amount of pull elsewhere. Then there's one of the objectives that Putin put forward himself, protecting the people of the Donbass. All right. So let's just take this one literally and at face value. You may also have heard this argument as one in which Ukraine was shelling the Donbass relentlessly for years and Russia had to intervene. Okay, so let's look at the UN report here. In 2020, eight civilians in the Donbass were killed on both sides of the dividing line by active hostilities. A further 17 were killed by mines and unexploded ordnance and one by other causes, leaving a total of 26 civilians killed. In 2021, the figure of civilians killed by active hostilities, so shelling, was seven and a further 12 were killed by mines and unexploded ordnance, for a total of 25. So the relentless shelling that is alleged was killing approximately one civilian every two months. That's obviously still a very real tragedy, but if death rates like that justify an invasion, I expect to see Russian paratroops in Chicago any day now. All right, so that... <laughs> wow, that's kind of what a dick. <laughs> I mean, please clear out Chicago, make it safe. Well... 
the idea that they're on some sort of humanitarian mission across the world to stop people from dying. Like, so they, oh, they have to invade Chicago. That's now. America, baby. <laughs> that's, that's massive, massive projection, yeah. But, but look, here's the thing. Okay, yes, more people are dying now as opposed to the 14,000 that died in the period of eight years. But what's his point here? What what do you tolerate, right? So, okay, only a, only seven or eight people are dying a year. He's not counting injuries here, by the way, and, and property damage. But because if you retaliate, you know, uh, what, what is it like? The only acceptable answer to attack is suicide or whatever that you say. It's like, so because they might cause more damage if they retaliate, they just have to accept that the Donbass is just going to be shelled forever because, look, it's only killing, like, 10 people a year okay so you can't start a war over it you just have to deal with that forever it's it's fine like i mean this is just disgusting yes yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of the same argument of like oh you know sorry britain you know 2000 v2 rockets have hit london you lost the war you know by fighting germany it's just the same kind of fucking logic it's so stupid all right so in order to save the population of the Donbass from suffering seven civilian casualties from shelling and active hostilities per year, Russia, of course, launches its invasion. And if we look at the official statistics of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic, only covering their territory, not Luhansk, not the Ukrainian-controlled territories, and only what they will admit, over the course of 2022, 4,176 military personnel and 1,089 civilians were killed directly as a result of military activities. Other sources suggest that the military casualties should in fact be far higher. But looking just at civilians, because that's who Vladimir Putin was presumably trying to protect, by invading, he has increased casualties in the Donetsk People's Republic, assuming all of those seven killed in 2021 were in Donetsk, which isn't true. He has increased the casualty rate for civilians by 155 times. Many of the settlements in the Donbass are now or anyone want to add anything to that? I mean, it's all that was just so disgusting. Uh, I don't know <laughs> how how are you how is can that be tolerated? Um, these you're being shelled. You you can't retaliate because if you retaliate, you'll kill more people. So you just have to take it. I mean, yeah, that's, the, the that's only acceptable attack, uh, response to attack is suicide again. But w w where maybe I missed as he began to lay those numbers out. But you've got 14,000 people who were killed in that period, according to the OSCE numbers. And how is he arriving at this uh, thing of seven or whatever? Is he just uh, sticking I think just, in, uh... and just on the pro-Russian side as if the, the, the deaths of everyone else, both military and civilian on both sides in Ukraine didn't matter? I mean, what? I believe he elected the cherry pick data. Um in 2021 i haven't checked the osc osce data i mean a lot of those 14,000 deaths also occurred in the first uh, year of the civil war too so you're not going to see huge numbers of people dying in the shelling and i i if i recall it's been a while since i looked at the data um that might be a legit number that you know quote unquote only seven or eight people died or whatever in in 2021 i think he said um, so that might be true. But again, he's ignoring that this is going on for eight years. Also, he's ignoring the injuries and the property damage and just the the idea that they're shelling. They're shelling you. <laughs> they're shelling people that they claim as civilians being their... randomly. Right. They're not they're they're shelling random civilians. It... Also, also, just on that basis, very quickly, it's a it's a it's an idea that P Perun and people of his ilk are ignoring that, you know, Basically, this could have been retaliated to, against immediately or far earlier than what the Russians have done in light of this. And it's actually a, um, a, a complete ignoring of the restraint shown by what is a major power and the major power that's being directly impacted by this in their immediate proximity. I mean, for, for instance, extrapolate this if this, this was a, um, you know, a contentious area between Texas and Mexico or something, or, you know, Canada and Alaska, and the USA just sat by for seven years and did nothing. I mean, would the USA show that restraint? Well, frankly, no. the restraint, you know. and that's an intentional reference on my part, the restraint here showed by Russia is phenomenal. Um, and you could not possibly exactly the Americans yeah. ever being restrained in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly within its proximity, Charlie, you got to think the Ameri the, the like the the U.S. foreign policy has been aggressive 
far beyond its own borders, never mind on its own doorstep. You got to you got you got to think like this isn't um, this would be the equivalent of this happening in Alaska or Cuba or Mexico, not they've, Iraq or Libya, for instance, right? They've certainly been disciplined. I'll give them that for sure. Okay, let's get now ruins. That photo there is from April last year, I believe, of a town called Novotoshkivka. It looks like something out of The Walking Dead, frankly, and I'm sure whatever residents remain are feeling well and truly protected and liberated. The Donbass has suffered from shelling, bombing, and the DNR and LNR also from extensive conscription. We've talked before about how much of the male population was used as essentially disposable mobilised personnel long before Russia declared its own mobilisation. While we'll only get exact details after the end of the war, I hate to imagine how many years it will take for this region to recover, if it ever does. And then uh, it's very sad. I'd love to hear him jump in and explain how, you know, they claimed to liberate Europe from the Nazis, but look at how, uh, look at how all these uh, ports, these port towns along the coast of Normandy have been like sh shattered and have suffered as a result of uh, your claim to want to liberate the citizens. It's just, it's, it's just so sleazy. Yeah. He's, he's never read about the battle of Khan or, 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 um, you know, anything like that, has he? Then there's the goal of demilitarizing Ukraine and repressing what the Russians call Ukrainian nationalism or quote, Nazism. Understanding this idea probably requires a deeper dive into Russian ideology and thinking than I have time for here. But suffice to say to some Russian ideologues, the very idea of Ukrainian nationalism, the idea of Ukraine as an independent culture, language, tradition, and state is threatening to the idea of the greater Russian world. In an ideal world, Russia probably wants a government in Kyiv which is friendly to Russia and which views Ukraine as secondary and subservient to Russia. But since I mean, Russia has explicitly too, said though. that regime change is not one of their objectives, I'm going to assume that even in a Russian victory scenario, they don't make it to Kyiv and they don't install a pro-Russian government. And even if they did, it would probably be overthrown relatively quickly because there is no event of the past century that has done more, I would argue, to cement the popularity, the idea of a Ukrainian national identity than the Russian invasion. To say that the opinion the Ukrainian public has of Russia has changed would be an understatement. Many have seen friends die, many have fought, many have suffered, many have had the lights or the heating go off because of Russian bombardment. Many have friends, families, and loved ones that will never come home. And based on historical precedent, yep. it's unlikely I think uh, he, he has a point here, and I believe that this point uh, is uh, was taken into consideration by uh, the decision makers behind the scenes who, who have uh, been plotting this war for quite some time and finally managed to uh, precipitate it, which is that even if, uh, even if they lose, uh, they win um, in so far as they'll have, uh, uh, you know, even more thoroughly alienated uh, uh, much of the Ukrainian population, certainly the Western portions, um, you know, from Russia and made a uh, rapprochement, uh, impossible. So yeah, this is, uh, absolutely a case where, you know, the United States and uh, the NATO powers or NATO power, the United States, who, whoever it is that's behind it, uh, they win, uh, in either case, but you know, you don't, you don't see him talking about how they get to rake in money hand over fist with, uh, with weapon sales uh, as well, you know, it's just how he chooses to present this uh, that I take issue with. But it's a it's a fair point, and I think it yes. was reckoned uh, by the people who did this that um, that's that's just one of the bonuses, no matter what happens. Likely, those people will ever forgive Russia for what it's done. We're talking about a country in which people who used to speak Russian as their first language now often try to struggle through with Ukrainian instead as some form of personal political statement. Even if you get Ukraine to sign some agreement saying that it's going to be a, quote, neutral state, you don't get to legislate people's opinions. You don't get to change minds with treaties. And so I'd suggest there's a genuine chance that even in a Russian victory scenario, what they face is a revanchist Ukrainian population for years or decades to come. Governments that try and rally the population around reclaiming lost territories. Resistance movements that continue to wage war in those areas to make Russian occupation untenable. 
and a political environment where there is no doubt anymore that Ukraine's loyalties lie in the West, not towards Moscow. Putin hasn't destroyed Ukrainian patriotism and Ukrainian nationalism. He's entrenched it in a way that no other human being on this planet had the power to do. And some of that threat in... Yeah, well, that's definitely true. Uh, I mean, the question is, is that a strategic defeat? Um, well, it depends on what Russia controls by the end of the war. Um, again, the point of this is that, uh, you know, this whole thing has already been a strategic failure. I mean, is hardcore Ukrainian nationalism uh, a problem for Russia? Yes. Uh, does that mean they failed strategically? For sure. We definitely can't say that. It's also a question of where you want to start the damn story. You know, he could conduct this exact same analysis and include much of the same information about the the results and the feelings and the dead people and the smashed infrastructure and the rest and simply start with the Western backed color revolution uh, in 2014, uh, where, you know, people who wanted to see this uh, color revolution go forward and wanted to foment uh, civilian response um, uh, allegedly, you know, just fired into crowds, uh, snipers firing from that building. You know, it's just a matter of what, when you want to start talking about the story. You know, has mm -hmm. has Ukraine benefited um, since the Maidan? You, so you say Russia precipitated it. Well, if you see a sequence of events, one leading to another, at least from, from certain perspectives, you know, let's just look at the, the same issues, but from the perspective, perspective of uh, Western uh, machinations in 2014, rather than the subsequent events that can all be traced back to that, at least arguably. Yeah, I mean, like, this is going to be the big thing to let is, is what comes next. And I, I think he's painted a rather accurate picture for what is to come, because it doesn't matter if, say, Russia only keeps what it, its 2014 lines or it secures all four of those oblasts. What will come next will be, I would imagine, American-supported or Western-backed uh, anti-Russian groups inside those oblasts, which will make the territorial integrity untenable for some degree, kind of like Syria and with the Islamic State. I would imagine that you're going to see an influx of migrants, which will make the um, ethnic you know, homogeneity of Ukraine, as well as Russia, become even more untenable. And I would certainly imagine that you're going to see Revenkist governments, not just inside whatever Ukrainian rump state will come out of it, but also in more in you know impassioned uh, leaders alongside Poland and Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, and the others. Because, well, hell, you know, if it could happen to Ukraine, it could happen to me, and that leads to an area for more escalation or for other flashpoints to happen, and potentially you know other areas closer to say the. Uh, trip wire that is Kaliningrad, right? Like these are the things that I'm thinking about when he's presenting these points. Um, I don't think you're going to, there, there is no thing. I don't think you're getting a, a neutral Ukraine unless you somehow manage to depose of Zelensky and get someone in there that doesn't have Western support. And that right now to me seems like a very, like, like a snowball's chance in hell. But I mean, like he's got a lot of good points here. Um, and unfortunately I don't know what will come out of it in the next five to 10 years, but it's a disaster on both sides demographically. It's a disaster for Christians, as it always tends to be with these wars with Western influence. And uh, billions upon billions of dollars have only uh, reduced one of the most fertile and productive parts of Eastern Europe uh, into rubble. If I could uh, jump in here real mm -hmm. quick. Um, the, the big issue as well is... Um, like, what do you do if you're Russia and, and the U.S. starts to, to after the, this war finally concludes, to, to use separatist groups and, and that sort of thing in the usual manner to undermine Russia's, you know, whatever whatever the U.S. would think was ill-Russia's ill-gotten gains, right? Um, so what you're doing from the United States' perspective is, yeah, you're still forcing them to fight to the last Ukrainian, but you're also forcing Russia to play the the villain right you're forcing russia to actually conquer all of ukraine or conquer most of ukraine or as much of it as they can actually get their hands on and and what do you do if you're russia and the united states eventually starts to you know foment all of this this hostility or you know these these militant groups after the war ends well you're 
you have to engage in counterinsurgency operations. And as everybody knows, the counterinsurgency operations always devolve down to, you know, destroying pe a people, destroying their culture, casting them entirely out of the land that they were in. And so if you're the United States, this is a very easy way in future to, you know, make Russia in into the bad guy that it w wants and it needs them to be. Yeah, it's going to fester in the corner, uh, particularly useful for people who always use the pretext of a humanitarian in intervention uh, to, to, to justify um, their, their actions. But we should also remember that the Russians have shown a pretty uh, good hand with uh, dealing with internal dissent, uh, specifically um, the kind of destabilization that we're um, envisioning here uh, and Western backed in the case of... Uh, of Chechnya. ...of changing opinions and attitudes, we're already seeing bear fruit. Ukraine isn't waiting for the end of this war to become more economically, politically, socially integrated with Europe. That process is happening right now. The Ukrainian power grid is now synced up with the European one. The number of train lines and physical connections between Poland and Ukraine have been expanded over the course of the war. Agreements on reduced friction in trade and customs are taking place, bringing Ukraine into closer and closer alignment with the European Union. And then, of course, there is the matter of human movements and influence. Millions of Ukrainians currently reside in the European Union. They have a voice. They've found a temporary home during this horrible crisis. Quote, unquote, and overall, <laughs> Europe has been happy to take them. Connections aren't just forged between nations, they're forged between populations, they're forged between people. And that process doesn't get reversed just because Russian troops take another basement or apartment building on the outskirts of Bakhmut. And for all this, what does Russia get in return? What is it taking to counterbalance the changes in the overall strategic environment? I mean, we'll press F for Canada because of all those Ukrainians that are there. Yeah, the other you, we're, they're sure to love them once their their countries get swamped with them as refugees, and, and Russia can't take away the the love and the the warm fellow feeling that will exist between these massive um, uh, refugee populations that have been scattered across Europe and beyond. Uh, also, he's talking about uh, Ukraine here as though it's a functional state, like the entire thing is on life support. If you pull out, if you pull out the Western funding for literally every single thing that's going on there from corruption to, you know, your telephone working or, you know, you continuing to get electricity if, if it's even available. Like the minute that uh, that life support system is turned off, the whole thing croaks. And he's talking about what's happening with Ukraine and its connections with other countries. The country's dead. It's on life support. Yeah, so the, the next part he just sort of, I mean, here he's just going to talk about how, yes, it's going to be a huge cost. Uh, all this is wrecked. It's going to be so expensive for Russia. Uh, I don't think we need to listen to all this in detail unless anybody wants to. I'm happy to do that if you want to. I, I really think the only major takeaway from this is going to be, um, you know, he's talking about the potential and the destruction. And what we're going to see come out of this, right, and the same thing that we've been seeing play out has been that this has sort of kick-started the question about well, what happens next. Where's the next front? Russia is very seriously concerned about China. Ukraine has lost a good chunk of its population due to migration, which will continue to play a large role in ethnic grievance politics and European, American, and Canada, Canadian politics all across the globe. Uh, China is going to be a serious concern where you're talking about not wanting to treat Taiwan like a Ukraine. And so I'm I'm just looking at this, you know, about what's to come next. And yeah, don't don't forget uh, Niger. Yeah, you yeah you can't forget everything that's playing out in in Niger, and uh, of course the issue over uh, the French and the Americans as well. Um, and then of course like Russia's political influence and soft power, cough cough, Jackson Hinkle. But these are the things that are playing out before our eyes. And I just don't see them stopping regardless of whether or not the war ends tomorrow or five years from now. Um, yeah. So he's getting more into the, you know, loss of uh Russian military assets. It's going to be so expensive to rebuild. They're losing their soft power and influence, you know, some valid points in here, but you know, that is what it is. I don't want to, I want to try and, you know, get out 
before three hours. So let's try and kind of get to the conclusion here. Alliances. <laughs> so in essence, Russia has wrecked their economy, their military, and their influence around the world in order to prop up American influence, encourage Ukrainian nationalism, drive NATO expansion and rearmament, and comprehensively destroy the areas of Ukraine it set out to, quote, save. And all of that is in a hypothetical scenario where Russia wins. Because that was a best... Uh, um, before I let him continue, there's one other thing he said earlier in the video. I think I probably skipped it. But at some point, he makes this snide little remark where he says, if Russia's goal is to denazify Ukraine, the best thing they could do is leave because then there would be less Nazis in Russia or less fascists in uh, Ukraine. Um, so it basically saying the Russians are the are fascists. Uh, just annoying little Reddit nonsense. This case scenario, that was a scenario where Russia gets to keep Zaporizhia and Kherson and Donetsk and Luhansk, which is pretty impressive considering they don't currently fully control any of those regions. Well, okay, they don't control them right now, but what if they control them in the future? I don't know. It's a world well, in which Ukraine oh. never joined. <laughs> I was just going to say, and, and the thing is too, they, they talk about the the uh, um, the split between, for instance, uh, Kherson and Zaporozhye, the fact that Russia doesn't control the entirety of the oblasts. I mean, as we know, and we've canvassed obviously before, like the 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 pullout from the. West Bank of Kherson and the Russians is holding the river line for the time being, but the majority of all four of these oblasts are controlled, and in essence, the Russians have more or less completely reoccupied the entirety of Luhansk. So, if we're talking about the percentage of objectives of these first line victory conditions for Russia, they're already like 80 90 percent of the way there anyway. So, you know, it's kind of coped to sort of say, Oh, well, they don't quite control them yet. It's like, no, they they vastly control the majority of them. Um, all they really, really need to do in, term, in terms of the Russians are concerned is to get back on the west bank of the of the uh, Dnieper and then also in terms of Zaporozhye to actually take Zaporozhye city. Um, mm -hmm. and, in, and if they start pushing into, um, if they start reoccupying those places such as Liman and Izium, they'll be in a position to actually um, take the rest of Donetsk uh, Oblast once they're in a position to actually attack places like Slavyansk and Kramatorsk and um Konstantinivka etc so I mean you know they're, they're, they're well on the way there and uh, this is just you know again a bit more of another Perun coup so to speak joins NATO never joins the European Union and while I don't claim to predict how this war will end that seems incredibly unlikely the reasons for that are myriad you could argue it's because Russian military advances when they currently happen are usually measured in meters not in dozens of kilometers Evgeny Prigozhin himself has come out and said it'll probably take Russia literal years just to take the Donbass, so to say nothing of reclaiming Kherson or taking Zaporizhia. I, I mean, that, that might be true, but, but oh, okay. you know, treating Prigozhin like he's some really important source, I mean, it's kind of stupid. Oh. Uh, the, other, yeah, the, other, the other point here to, to take is, uh, to, to touch on, which I wanted to say, is that, you know, the thing about meters or whatever is is, is obviously right. half true in the, in the case of these sort of, um, uh, in, in the case of these like confrontation positional battles or these attritional battles such as you know what's happening in Marinka, what what happened in Bakhmut, places like this etc but what is the other measure of of um of russian gain well it's the number of body bags of ukrainians that are being sent back home and when you see those videos of people driving past ukrainian um military cemeteries where there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crosses and I'm sure I can speak for all of us on the panel and our viewers by saying that that is a monumental tragedy from a, a humanitarian and a Christian standpoint. But ultimately, however which way we cut the you know cut this apart, that is how wars are won and lost ultimately. And the Russians are achieving that. And you know, it's it is great denialism to try and ignore the point. Well, that's the main problem with all the NATO shell takes. Basically, is they always treat the war like they're playing a game of risk or something and completely yeah. ignore the attritional aspects of the war, which is how the war, you know, really gets won. If yeah. you assume actually, the only actually, way for Russia... Oh, yeah. Sorry, Charlie. No, Whit Whitworth just commented here, and he's very, uh, he's very on point. Has he not read Clausewitz? Defeating the enemy army is most important. Um, territory naturally follows from that. And that's the thing. A lot of commanders in history, um, I was going to say, to, to some degree, if you sort of look at, 
elements of Napoleon's career. It's like, yes, you can dominate, you know, two thirds of Europe, but if you actually haven't defeated the enemy in detail and, you know, sent his soldiers, you know, into, into graveyards, or well, you're not actually achieving total victory. This is something that in the Russian and to some degree, the Soviet mindset of World War II absolutely understood even if it, uh, in, in the soviet context even if it's on a mountain of your own belt of your own of you know mountains of bodies of your own soldiers providing you do more damage to the enemy and you actually defeat them in detail as they did do to the wehrmacht in world war ii um that ultimately ensures victory as brutal as that is that is a, an absolute truism of modern warfare Russia to win, and I think the only way for Russia to win is for the Western countries to pull their military and economic support for Ukraine, while that's much less likely in a universe where Russia is pursuing maximal war aims. If Russia says, hey, we will go home if you pinky promise to never join NATO, then a lot of Western countries would go to Kiev and go, hey, do you want to at least consider that one? I mean, that's just ridiculous because that was the, that was the original attempted state of affairs. The idea that if Russia was like, uh, you know, let's make a deal, and the NATO backers would be like, "Okay, let's do it." I mean, it's total fucking <laughs> d dissembling, lying, slithering bullshit. <laughs> but if Russia says we're going to annex swaths of Ukrainian territory, enforce neutrality, and then probably have another go at Ukraine in a number of years, well, in terms of both strategic terms and in terms of politics, that's going to be really unpalatable to a lot of Western leaders. It'll be much cheaper politically and economically to just keep up support and similarly Ukrainian resistance too. So taken together, I'd suggest the chances of Russia quickly and efficiently achieving its maximal war goals are about the same odds as this video has of having a 100% like ratio. Hypoth there he says it again. It's like for some reason you see this idea where if they don't win quickly uh, and decisively, then they lose. Like obviously that's always preferable. But for some reason, if they take too long, uh, that means they lose. Theoretically yeah, possible, but I would more. bet my life savings against it. And yet, the longer the war goes on in pursuit of those maximal objectives, the more destabilized and tired Russia will become. I've said before that Russia has the financial and military resources to carry on this conflict for some time. But those resources aren't infinite. And with every ruble spent and every bunker emptied of its stored ammunition or hardware, Russia will become that little bit weaker. That he, he is ignoring the fact that Ukraine can run out of Ukrainians because the West can send all the equipment at once and all the high technology at once. But the fact is, we're not sending actual people. Well, there definitely are some there, but you get what I'm saying is the war is mm -hmm, right. know, mostly yeah. driven by Ukrainian infantry. And as those die, then... The, that's the the irreplaceable resource that Ukraine is losing, and particularly he's, amongst he's ignoring the oh, fact sorry, that the, par, pardon me, sir. Uh, that no, they, no, he's ignoring the fact that it's a, it's a wider uh, it's a proxy war and it's a wider war, and so if you want to hammer Europe into line, um, and I'm not saying I'm for this, but certainly the Russians want to teach Europeans a lesson, uh, Europeans lessons in some respects in order to bring them back around to the kind of relationship that Russia wants. And if that is the larger uh, game board, and I, I think it's it's insane to believe that it isn't, um, then it taking longer could absolutely uh, suit uh, Russia's purposes. I mean, look what's happening if indeed it continues to unfold in the way that seems likely. Look what's happening again with uh, Niger or Niger or whatever. I mean, this becomes a, a bigger uh, entanglement and m m the stakes get higher and people are committed in more ways and further ways, uh, it absolutely can serve Russia's interest. It's, it's really, um, I think, unfair, uh, dishonest, dissembling, slithering of him to, uh, to, to look at the conflict through this narrow lens when anyone with any sense recognizes that it's much larger. Yeah, That's like this, this is a really narrow way to look at the war. And I mean, like, again, go back to like the Belarusian uh, Polish thing with with migrants. Do you not think that Russia isn't remotely considering in the back of their head? How do we further like strain European governments by causing up tensions in sub-Saharan Africa, which could lead to millions of more migrants coming up through the Mediterranean? Like, I, I, I would think that if I wanted to weaken the Europeans. Like, yeah, I mean, and Ukra I Ukrainian migrants in Poland and the, the, the historical tensions 
Yeah, so, let's Ukraine. go touch that nerve of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Let's ignore Armenia versus Azerbaijan. Let's ignore um, Kazakhstan or, or the other former Soviet republics or Syria, for uh, goodness sakes, and the influence between Israel and gas pipelines. Like, it's a very narrow way to view this conflict. And I understand we do get bogged down in the day to day with the reports and the casualties and the map updates and what it looks like by the yards gained and the blood lost. But at the end of the day, this is a much larger conflict and it's going to play out all across the globe where there are clashes between spheres of influence. And I don't care particularly for you know, either side of this conflict, but, you know, realistically speaking, you cannot look at this just by what's going down inside urban warfare in like, you know, Kherson or whatever. And um, uh, another oh. point about it taking longer. So, sorry, Furious. No, no, you're right. oh, good. US, U.S. elections, for fuck's sake. You know, maybe it's a great thing because the entire U.S. regime could conceive of, not saying it will, but could conceivably change and support for the war would simply dissipate overnight in 2024 under that scenario. So again, it's dishonest. Sorry, Furious. No, no, all good. Um, yeah, no, this is this is um, many, many good points raised between you two just there. Um, one thing I, I do want to just touch on is that this sort of timescale thing is very indicative of a modern Western mindset that is obsessed with you know, the sort of shock and awe mindset of, you know, like, oh, we're just going to send Christmas uh, into Baghdad and, you know, we'll roll up Saddam's army in a couple of months and that's the campaign done and dusted. Uh, that's not how everybody views war, particularly from a, a standpoint of seriousness. And um, Glow in the Dark actually made a good comment here, uh, which I agree with. Most Russians live in a world where the war doesn't even exist apart from news segments between pieces of Siberian fisheries and zoo animals. I think they have a long way to go before exhaustion. Um, it's when you look at the sort of social sociocultural and economic um indicators in the west it, it appears that we're the ones that probably are teetering more on the brink of perhaps exhaustions not the correct word but certainly destabilization as, as a result of um insufficient resources and then sort of the second and third order consequences that might derive from that um we're the ones that are more liable to suffer that problem um because again uh you look at those who have attempted to fight, shall I say, the Anglosphere or the West in previous times, they may have had uh, industrial base, um, but lacked the, the raw materials. Russia, on the other hand, can actually ach achieve uh, degrees of autarky between having a pretty, um, what appears to be a substantive military industrial complex of its own, in concert with a, you know, a relatively substantial civilian economy that can at least attend to its um, essential needs. Meanwhile, um, it you know it, it can't be cut off from its essential raw materials because it possesses them, and then any minor deficiencies it does have, it's able to uh, trade with you know people in its sphere. For example, you know, it can trade with Iran, it can trade with Azerbaijan, it can trade with the um, you know like Kazakhstan and you know its its Central Asian peripheral allies, and it can trade with China. And um, you know there's there's no way that the West can intercede with that, and so um you know and then again we're, we're sort of talking also distinctions of temperament and psychology and character and you know russians have a very different set in that regard to those of us in the west who probably don't have the um you know the resilience or the attention span to actually carry through a protracted war whereas i think the russians are much less um enfeebled in that regard one, uh, one other thing to add before we continue is I thought your point about the protracted war, Oliver, uh, having its own benefits, interesting because uh, one, one could imagine the scenario where, you know, the Russians did uh, take Kiev and sort of do a quick uh, transfer of power and, and, you know, install their own government. But perhaps Europe would not have learned the lesson that they are looking to teach in that scenario. And maybe that wouldn't have actually, although it would have been a decisive military campaign, maybe it would not have had decisive geopolitical effects. I'm not saying they like lost on purpose or something in 40 chess. I'm just, I think that was an interesting observation. Uh, all right. So it doesn't mean, of course, that the Russian Federation is likely to immediately collapse. I don't even think for most Western strategists, that's even a goal. I think it's a terrifying concept to most of them. The potential of thousands of loose nukes and global economic disruption isn't particularly high on anyone's priority list. I don't but know, just don't, because don't they it... outright say that that's 
would they want it like the think tanks maybe i'm wrong about i that. mean how many think tank people <laughs> and like really angry european uh nato guys are like actually this is what a decolonized russia looks like whether it's propaganda or not like you're throwing rhetorically the gauntlet down that the russian state should not exist and at what point do i not look at that as an existential threat <laughs> Like what the fuck? It doesn't. Well, that 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 was actually. I'll I'll point this out at the end. But a, a book I reviewed actually makes that exact point. Where the that's what the think tanks are saying in America that we want to dismantle Russia. So do you just ignore that? I mean, I don't know. Collapse doesn't mean its strategic influence, its position in the world, isn't diminished. A Russia that comes out of this war, even a Russia that wins this war according to its own definition, is more isolated, poorer and weaker. It's a country more isolated than ever from its former primary market, the European Union, a market it will never get back, and one that is more dependent than ever on Beijing's support. Now, if you listen to the first part of this presentation... So that's, that's actually interesting because, again, in the book I reviewed recently on my blog, I'm not sure that the Russians really care about this European market uh, at sort of the level he's talking about. I mean, they're, they're building I'm, their I'm, own I'm... market. And, and they certainly care about it less than Europe itself does uh, in terms of uh, access to, uh, to cheap uh, Russian energy. I mean, he's he's like, you know, they've he's, he's like they've lost the European market and they'll never get it back. I'm like, yeah. And uh, and uh, Germany is being deindustrialized, you know, to use the Duran phrase. You know, it is it's being smashed. And uh, and Europe is uh, is under serious pressure in terms of energy. I asked a German guy last night, you know, how he expects uh, the the coming winter to be, and he said about like last time. And I was like, well, how would you characterize that? And he's like, well, people aren't you know freezing that we know of. You know, it's just a, a good bit more expensive, and it puts a whole lot more pressure on people. Um, and that you know, let's see if it's a if it's a warm winter. Uh, like it was last year, but these are, these are hammer blows to Europe. And so he can act like it's elective, right? That this is an elective choice. You know, it, Europe can choose whether or not to interact with Russia. No, the whole point thus far has been that they can't because they need the energy and uh, LNG shipments across the Atlantic aren't going to cut it. And they can try to work things with, you know, Nigerian pipelines crossing through the Sahel and issuing from uh, Algeria uh, and uh, for, thence uh, across the, the the Mediterranean to European markets, but it's not looking good in N Niger right now. And you know, in terms of uh, trying to d disentangle some of these uh, Western uh, Black Sea countries from uh, Russian energy, is proving to be much more difficult than anticipated. It's not an elective situation. It's not a situation where Europe gets to have the opinion that they'd rather not have energy from uh, Russia. Or it's certainly, it's uh, it's not as much that way uh, as he's claiming. There, there are all sorts of uh, uh, exigencies that that will require Europe to do b business with Russia in many respects, uh, whether they want to or not. Uh, you know, taking into account the fact that it's in Russia's interest to block every other way they try to do it. So it's not just whether they can arrange for shit to be stable in the Sahel or Africa or, you know, through the Balkans uh, or the East Mediterranean long enough to get the energy there. Uh, they're facing a Russia that's actively doing everything it can and that's in its power to block them as they attempt to do that. So, again, it's not about choice for Europe in the way that he's he's painting it here. You might think that that sounds a little bit doom and gloom on Russia's future. After all, you might argue, Perun, Russia has always bounced back in the past, hasn't it? The Russian Empire survived an enormous number of reverses before it finally collapsed. And also the Soviet Union, it survived the German invasion, was able to rebuild itself into a global power. By comparison to the destruction of World War I or the Second World War, there's no comparison to the war that's currently being fought in Ukraine. So why shouldn't we expect Russia to just rebuild itself back up to great power status yet again? The yeah, that, that's an interesting point. And again, <laughs> the, the book I reviewed uh, last in my blog makes this point as well, where the Russians actually seem to believe that they are in a much more uh, precarious situation than Russia was um, in any of those historic scenarios um, where, you know, we imagine Russia on the brink. So the Russians actually agree with him on that. 
answer is that there's only so many times you can come back from the dead, and the world has changed. In the past, Russia always rebounded from defeat on the back of certain advantages, its demography, its resources, its landmass. In relative terms compared to other countries, those have all eroded. The Russian Empire and later the Soviet Union used to have a considerably larger population than the United States. Now Russia is in the midst of deep demographic decay. There aren't enough children being born to maintain the workforce, and many of Russia's most talented go overseas and find jobs elsewhere. In Western countries with low fertility rates, the answer is often mass migration, which brings in working age people from other countries to fill out the demographic pyramid and keep the economy growing. That has been the US secret for Wretched decades. That there is no mass migration yeah, into the Russian face. Federation. Other countries are moving into industrial and economic areas that it used to dominate. Other countries produce oil and gas as well, and many of them do it considerably cheaper. And in terms of military power and influence, Russia's strength relative to both its European and also its Asian neighbours is continuing to decline. I mean, we should just make the point here, because he keeps bringing up Russian military like power. There's one thing that <laughs> the Russians are getting in this that no one else um, is other than the Ukrainian army. Uh, and that is uh, actual on-the-ground combat experience uh, in a 21st century, you know, fifth-generation war. Uh, the, the only two militaries in the world who have that experience are the AFU and uh, the Russian military. Um, and, you know, likely only there's only going to be one military by the end of it who's going to have that experience. And that's a big deal to actually... Um, you know, if you if you followed a lot of the actual day to day military affairs, you'll you'll see how both sides, but also the Russians, obviously, have uh, adapted to the type of warfare we're in. And in any future wars, that's going to make a huge deal. I mean, you know, just hypothetically, if NATO goes up against Russia, sure, NATO is participating in the war, but there's a difference between the managerial participation that. NATO is doing and actually having uh, the on the ground experience among your enlisted and your, your NCOs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and even more to the point on the technological front, Russia has now had to face up against most, if not all of the most modern Western systems, which we've sent in, you know, relatively small numbers, but they've, you know, they've still been sent. You've sent the switchblade, you've sent, you know, all of the, the, anti-tank missiles, you've sent the latest and greatest uh, German and British and American hardware in terms of armored vehicles. You've sent HIMARS. And what you're HIMARS doing... cruise missiles. Yep. Yes. And even those little freakish little uh, dragonfly-sized uh, observation drones. Yep. Yeah. And, and so what 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 does that do for Russia, right? It, obviously, it does the exact same thing as Charlie has, has noted here, which is that Russia now has seen what American and and NATO tech is capable of. You get intimately familiar with, okay, what is the range of these things? When are these things going to be deployed? And remember, all of these Ukrainians were trained by NATO. So they're going to be using them in a manner similar to how NATO has told them to use it. So we can thereby infer that Russia will have some experience in figuring out necessary countermeasures for all of this stuff um which is actually interesting if you want to use historical examples as well just look at the boer war and how the british expeditionary force was after the boer war totally transformed in into probably into in 1914 the the small and and decisive force that it needed to be in in the first world war um, after getting totally trounced in, in the Boer War because it just didn't have the right weapons or the right training. And of course, they, you know, they won that war, the Boer War, but they managed to change themselves and, and actually have military experience in the field um, and see what developments had occurred in the last like 30 or 40 years previous, whereas Germany in 1914, the last war they fought was in 1871 against France. So that's about a 40-year gap in terms of technology and and tactics, etc., where nobody has, other than Britain, had that experience. Oliver, were you uh, looking to jump in? Or did he basically say what you were going to? 
All right. Europe, Japan, China, these are all countries that are launching major rearmament programs. And all Russia will have to counterbalance that is whatever is left over after the war in Ukraine finishes. Some form of Russian recovery is entirely possible, even likely. But a move that causes them to rejoin the United States or the People's Republic of China in great power status, well, that's about as likely as me being elected mayor of Moscow. I mean, that, that's just stupid. It's a real risk. But the idea that it's literally impossible for them to you know, come out ahead in this is just idiotic. All regenerative capacity just isn't there anymore. Russia has coasted for decades on its inheritance from the Soviet Union. Putin bet the inheritance on the war in Ukraine and is about to lose it all. And yet, despite all of those strategic realities, Whoa. I think it is more than likely that this war is going to go on for some time yet. On one hand, it will continue because the Russian political elite can't afford for it not to continue. Pulling out of Ukraine without achieving all of Russia's stated objectives, without taking those four regions, would be seen everywhere, especially within Russia, as a defeat. Military defeat is historically an extremely dangerous experience for governments in Russia and other countries like it. People look for someone to blame. They look for an answer as to why people were killed or wounded or the economy ruined, if in the end it didn't even change things. So anything short of complete military victory probably moves an awful lot of Russian influential people that much closer to an 18th story window. But as long Weird as the war is still going, well, Ukraine you haven't lost. Respect. <laughs> people can still be Just told less... that they have to rally. Around. Hmm. Like unless something, you know, happens to him, uh, it doesn't matter how the war ends or if Zelensky, you know, picks a successor, that man will live on the wealth and a podcast and a book deal and a Netflix biography about him starring himself. Like let's, yeah, I'm funny. Yeah, I, don't Ukraine, I still predict yeah. that Zelensky will star in his own biopic on Netflix. Um, I guarantee it. Uh, we will see <laughs> around the flag for the sake of the war effort. Martial law can remain in place. Controls over the media can remain in place. And any attempt to unseat those in power can be painted as someone undermining the war effort. Even if it's ultimately a doomed effort, keeping the war going may be essential to keeping people in power. And much more importantly, just because Russia has suffered a strategic defeat doesn't mean that Ukraine's fate has been decided. War isn't necessarily I, I a win-lose game. Yeah. Um, the, the one key thing that I think is definitely worth discussing, and he he doesn't touch on it, but he, he references government and keeping people in power, is, is that we don't know if or who Putin's successor would be. Like, we kind of saw how it played out with, like, Mendevev, right, in 2010, and then you, like, you do a little bit of the, mag you, know, ma you know, magical chairs and stuff like that, and you just swap seats, and then he's president now. Um, we don't know who his successor is, and Putin's not getting any younger. Like, there's... The serious thing to consider about how this war plays out is who succeeds him, what camps are further to like the right on this issue than he is, who's more radical, who's more moderate. And I don't think anyone's talking about that. And I think that that's something that either we should or, you know, these commentators, uh, preferably us, uh, should look into. That's a good point, man. I have I, I know nothing of the landscape of like likelies and hopefuls beyond, you know, as you said, Medvedev that everybody discusses. Well, we will get to that uh, when I show my blog. It's possible to have both participants lose on net. And while it's pretty clear that Russia will come out of this in a worse strategic situation than it went in, Ukraine and its allies it, are still very much fighting yeah, for its future. Semyagog kind of mentioned this to me, but but notice how he's just kind of asserting that these things are going to happen like but he didn't really prove any of this he's just he's just saying that they're going to come out worse just that's that's the conclusion future at one extreme for example there exists a scenario where ukraine regains all of its sovereign territory it secures a recognition of its territorial integrity and its sovereignty it's free to apply to join nato and put itself on the path to european union membership it receives reconstruction funding and modernization assistance from the west and it builds itself into a part of the European security and economic infrastructure. Even in that scenario, Ukraine will be deeply wounded. It will have lost people, a lot of people. Its infrastructure will have suffered extreme damage. There will be a trauma that sits with its population potentially for a generation. 
that based on the conversations I've had, I'm convinced that most Ukrainians would look at that outcome and call it victory. At the other end of the spectrum, there's a scenario in which nothing is solved, the conflict is frozen, and Ukraine is left with all of these casualties and damage, knowing that it's just going to have to do it all again in a couple of years. That scenario may not be considered a victory for Russia, but I'd hardly call it a win for Ukraine either. I think it's almost certain that leaders in the West and in Kyiv know exactly that. They know that how this war ends matters. And while the media tends to focus on who's gained how many metres in the Donbass day to day or week to week, I have to hope that political leaders know better, that the strategic implications of this conflict stretch well beyond military control of metres of territory in the east of Ukraine. And it's also why I would probably bet that Ukraine's soldiers will continue to fight on, despite casualties, despite hard conditions, despite the might of the Russian army that opposes them. Because oh, we do have to give them that. I mean, the Ukrainians are fighting like hell, and in yeah, I mean, they're yeah, uh, they're, they're no question about whether they'll fight. While Russia has already, almost from the moment it stepped into Ukraine, suffered a strategic defeat, the fighting to come will determine whether Ukraine does as well or finds at the end of the tunnel something that deserves to be called victory. In conclusion, Russia has a long history of being a great power and an empire. Whether it was during the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union, it was the same basic resources in many cases that helped build Russian influence and power. And it was often the same sort of mistakes that brought those empires down. And in Ukraine, they presented themselves once again. Corruption, overconfidence, overextension, and an inability to understand that the Finns, the Bolts, the Poles and the Ukrainians don't want to be Russians, they want to be Finns, Bolts, Poles, and Ukrainians. However the fight in Ukraine now ends, Russia will have failed to achieve the majority of its strategic objectives. Whether judged by the Pranakov Doctrine or the objectives that Putin himself set out, even military victory for Russia now would represent a strategic defeat. But while that's important context for analysing and understanding the war, it's equally important to understand that Ukraine's fate has not yet been decided. By most strategic measures, Russia may already have lost, but it will be up to the Ukrainians, the West and the fortunes of war to determine whether or not Ukraine wins. All right, channel update to close out. Can I, can I, we, we don't, make we don't a, need that. <laughs> I just want to make a quick remark here. He's yeah. obviously progressive. He's obviously leftist or willing to toe the party line on, you know, uh, turning to replacement migration to uh, deal with uh, dwindling childbirths and the rest and how, you know, Russia as a corrupt and backward place has a, uh, a, t a terrible issues with, uh, with uh, replacing its population. And, and, uh, and, and so he talks and it, he goes from that, which clearly does establish that he's just, he's a, He's a he's a quote unquote center left uh, a, a dipshit. I mean that, that echoes through everything that he says, and then he turns around and 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 says that Ukraine and and you know Latvia and Lithuania and Poland these countries don't want to be Russian. They want to be Latvian and Lithuanian and Ukrainian, and it's it's the same sleazy sort of uh, Promethean country range uh, ginning up and superficial support for nationalism that we see all over the joint. You know, as as I was talking about, due to coming in in 2014 and and pumping this kind of uh, this kind of nationalism for mass consumption because it suits the powers that back him to foster nationalism in these uh, eastern countries right now. But this guy is so fundamentally dishonest that he doesn't think about the gasterbeiters and the replacement population that's going to have to come into a country like Ukraine after having lost so many people to uh, to uh, those who fled the country. Yes, yeah, some of them will come back, but how many are going to be in a hurry to do so uh, during you know a whole massive period of reconstruction? They're going to end up with their equivalent from wherever it comes of a uh, you know Turkish gasterbeiters. You know, it's just it, it, the inconsistencies are just slimy as they always are. Indeed. Um, all right. So this video is about six months old. We've you know watched a good chunk of it. Um, I'm gonna go AFK for just a second. But how has the video aged in six months? Go. Who wants to go first? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll take. Someone start. has to go, so I can go AFK. <laughs> okay, I'll yeah, go. Furious, I'll, uh, take it. I'll uh, I'll stop. Um, to be frank, it 
I, I mean, to be frank, uh, Charlie did share this with me a while back, and actually, we kind of got halfway through sort of watching it amongst ourselves, and we just this video didn't quite materialize until now. Um, I would say, from the just as a starting point, that this video aged poorly the minute it was uploaded. <laughs> it just, you know, the thing is, is, it's the problem when people, you know, try and make a point on the basis of, like of a false premise, and um, you know, often will misrepresent things as they they are i mean we've obviously unpicked several things in this video between well you 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 fall before i jumped in and then when i came on we've all sort of done our bit to sort of pick it apart um it's just one of those one of those things where not approaching this topic you know with seriousness and um and doing so in a in a vacuum i know i have a propensity to tend to um utilize probably a little too much historical analogy um, but still, the conflicts of this kind, and, and I mean, you got to think, uh, and, and I've repeated this before, that this Russia-Ukraine thing has, or certainly is, the largest conventional conflict that Europe has seen since the Second World War. Um, and we, for most of us in our lifetimes, uh, certainly anyone you know under the age of you know fifty or or, or people who would have participated in Vietnam have not seen a conventional conflict of this scale um, and to this just degree of sort of destruction and violence. Um, you know, this is sort of new territory for us, you know, in sort of our our technological epoch. And we are all in the process of learning things and, 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 and trying to ascertain how these weapon systems work in a conventional setting. You know, it's one thing, to, you know, to, to use sort of, you know, updated A-10 warthogs and, you know, cruise missiles against, you know, Baghdad and, you know, Kandahar and Kabul and you're sort of fighting asymmetrical warfare against you know the Taliban etc I mean it's, it's just it, that is a very different thing to what this is and so you know all of us need to sort of take some humble pie and you know learn along the way like even for myself I mean I, I made a I think it might have been the, sec, the first or second time I spoke about this on UO myself I sort of thought that oh you know Russia's probably going to try and push the you know Dnieper River it will try and you know outflank uh, Kramatorsk and Slobyansk and encircle it um, and that just did not happen uh, at that point none of us really knew what Russian strength was at the time uh, now you got to think we're 18 months on from the start of the war we probably have a better understanding of you know Ukrainian strength from the onset Russian strength from the onset what approximate Ukrainian casualties are now kind of what R Russian casualties are at this point we have a much better understanding of the disparity of or, or rather balance of power between the two forces of play um so you know the the absolute certainty in which these sort of nafo types make these proclamations and we'll do it from a standpoint of you know intellectual dishonesty and misrepresentation and doing so with a um uh, try to think of how to word this you know a, a, almost utter ignorance of historical context um you know is baffling but in the end how much of it is truly informative and how much of it is propaganda value i mean for anyone for instance actually i noticed in the chat someone mentioned how the king how king generals is indistinguishable from the onion nowadays um you know there you go there's a, this wonderful example of, of a channel that actually produced really really wonderful historical content and i'll ah, admit i i did enjoy it yeah but you know exactly charlie and now There's you know every 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 second video they upload just makes me yeah thank you unsubscribe <laughs> <laughs> but you know and that's thing, like you, you, you might you might see um you know they're, they're doing a series on the peloponnesian war like fantastic like you know the peloponnesian war is one of the most interesting conflicts of antiquity and yet there's this sort of this nagging part on the back of one's brain where you think to yourself i cannot take this channel seriously they have no i can't anymore literally they've become a captured institution so you know yeah i, I guess i'll stop there i'll pass it over to someone else yeah, I'll just say some concluding thoughts. Uh, I'll just be quick because I would like to get us closed out. I mean, my my interest in the war, other than the like you know personal interest in like the military perspective, is just uh, I, I'm not covering this because of uh, you know left or right wing politics or America versus Russia or nationalism. For me, I just see it as um, the the American government provoked a conflict in which hundreds of thousands of christians are dying on both sides and i don't want my government doing that and i would like to uh you know 
expose the propaganda that um, they're, you know, putting out there as much as possible um, in order to avoid things like this in the future. I mean, to me, that's that's my only real interest in in opposing the conflict is uh, the fact that, you know, at the end of it, probably millions of people will have died. And uh, I don't want that to happen. And as far and as I can tell, lives destroyed, United... Charlie, is a consequence of that. Exactly. And as far as I can tell from my best study, the United States uh, provoked this conflict. And even if it isn't, it's certainly uh, funding it maximally. And, you know, I'm I'm against that. Um, so conclusions, uh, someone not Marcus. Anyone want to go for it? Yeah, I'll, I'll... <laughs> actually, you know what? I forgot. We had that other article that you were interested in. I don't know if you want us to look at that. Um, um... I think I think we can probably save it for another time. Yeah, let's um, save that for later, because it's counter offensive yeah. related. We'll save that. Yeah. But can I, can yeah. I just laugh at? Can I just laugh at a joke just quickly? I'll just sort of scroll in the comments. Someone said, "Um, uh, where is it?" Someone said that like the capture of the, oh here we go, <laughs> Jacob Brown with the capture of the Zello Heights. There's nothing standing in the way of you <laughs> of Kiev. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Sorry, go go, Andrew. Yeah, as my concluding thoughts here. Um. I mean, just I've given my take on this, you know, many, many, many times. And and I am somebody who has been against the American war effort in Ukraine for pretty much the exact same reason as Charlie's outlined. Um, and uh, I, the lesson that we've got from all of our involvement in the Middle East is, you know, the United States seems to be incompetent at running proxy wars. And I don't think this particular proxy war is going to go any better for them. Uh, they have a, a very bad track record. I think there's every incentive for them, given the fallout from Afghanistan and the failure in, of the war on terror, uh, for them to double down and to try to to reclaim some level of um, uh, respect abroad uh, and, and perception of strength uh, abroad. And they need they need it, right? So, of course, they're going to to continue to fund Ukraine and, and to force Ukraine to die to the last Ukrainian. Um, I mean, I, I just have nothing else to say on it, really. That's my that's my take. Well, I'll give uh, Prude the final word then, because I just have a short thing to say, which is, um, on the one hand, uh, I think it's um, I'm I'm not sure that it's uh, uh, accurate to say that we're terrible at these proxy wars. Uh, we're terrible at winning them in the ways that we claim we intended, uh, but uh, I'm not sure that they don't work brilliantly uh, in terms of performing their real functions, which is to make the rich richer and you know help the poor to get youngins, as the expression goes. You know, these people, like we talked about earlier, with the idea of you know in certain ways Russia Russia is going to lose absolutely and has already lost uh, because of the nature of how these things are set up. They, the, 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 these great power players, in my view, are uh, big fans of the game. You know, heads I win, tails you lose. Now, in one case, it's better for me to win than for you to lose. But uh, but in either case, I, I move ahead. Um, otherwise, in terms of the question Charlemagne asked uh, before he was uh, AFK, um, I think the most important takeaway in terms of how this, I'm sorry, the, the most important conclusion I must strike that expression, take away from my vocabulary. <laughs> Most important conclusion we can uh, draw here about how it aged is is that it, uh, it they speak with a unity of voice. You know, five, six months ago, whatever it was, uh, Millie and Perun spoke with one voice, as we just saw. And six months, five months later, uh, Blinken and Biden speak with one voice. So if you want to understand who you're really dealing with, uh, with Perun, uh, and with these NATO shills more broadly, it's th those people who speak with one voice, the uh, the, the them. Mm, well said. Um, all right, Mr. Prudentialist. Uh, well, the, I guess the only thing I really do want to add here is is that you should definitely be giving uh, Charlemagne your money on Substack and be sure to support his great work there and his book reviews that have definitely helped me understand what some of these Russians are actually thinking because uh, he's got quite a few things on his own Substack uh, from Russian authors well worth your time to research and to give your uh, your money to. But other than that, I would say that the only thoughts that I really do have is, is that 
Um, either which way, both of these countries are going to be thoroughly depopulated of fighting age men, and whoever comes out on top will per probably be very, very happy to uh, fill them with uh, migrants elsewhere. And I do think that one of the things to consider as this conflict expands and you got the dealing with Turkey, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and the Sahel region with, uh, with Niger, that you're going to see migrants be used as a weapon more and more. We saw this between Belarus and Poland. I imagine we'll see more of that in the future, which if you're concerned about the demographics of your own country, um, do be aware that that's going to be an issue on both fronts of this conflict. And that uh, as for how well this video has aged, I think it does indicate how this uh, media coordination works and that uh, we're looking at things in a lens that I think is not is it's too narrow and it's also i think a rather poor way to analyze things with respects to second order consequences there's nothing in here that perun talked about with respects to grain or natural gas or semiconductors things that actually do matter but um that's really all i do have to add is is that narrow analysis and go support uh, mr charles main right here right now very good yes uh you teed me up because i was gonna show the sub stack not just uh for the sake of shilling, but uh, also the, you know, the last few books I've done, the last three actually, and then I'm doing a fourth one right now, have all been related to Russia, and it's actually been pretty good perspective. So I, we've got one from a Russian expat shit lib, um, I think is a fair description, and then I reviewed one from a German banker in the 1990s or 80s. And then this one is actually the most important one, I think, and these are paid posts, but there are like, pretty you know, sizable free previews if you're not paid. Um, this one is a uh, review uh, of a book by Sergei Glaz Glaziev, who is, I'll actually click uh, through it. He is actually a fairly important diplomat that's going to open in a new tab, so it won't open uh, the preview. Let me switch it real quick. He's actually a fairly uh, important diplomat. He is on the Eurasian Economic Commission, and he wrote this book called *The Last World War*, among another, uh, among a, uh, among many other books as well. This guy is significant. His his books are significant. I would say much more significant than Dugan because this is actually uh, an important diplomat who is, uh, you know, close to the Kremlin and is actually. Um, you know, in charge of foreign policy, particularly economic policy, uh, to a significant extent. Uh, and in particular, he's a Eurasianist. Uh, and if you kind of want to understand uh, Eurasianism from a perspective that makes any sense and not whatever nonsense Dugan is writing, um, I would definitely recommend at least uh, checking out my uh, preview of his book on uh, charlemagne.substack.com. Okay, so Furious, you wanted to add one more thing before we end the stream? Uh, yeah, just quickly. Yeah, uh, I, um, I wanted to quote a friend of mine who who commented on something. I think it was one of Mercurius's videos a, a couple of months back, and it was uh, along the lines of how sort of be it the Kiev regime or just you know the West sort of writ large, you know NATO and the kind of people who make decisions in the State Department and that sort of thing. There, because what we have seen is essentially the real war, the real war versus the propaganda war, essentially. And you know the fact that you know MSNBC and BBC and ABC and whatever will you know put out all this sort of information and run a sort of commentary on a very specific line on a sort of, sort of on a very specific narrative line, shall I say? And that is this propensity to celebrate symbolic victories over real victories, and uh, and that sort of brings me to a, a, a second thought. Um, which is, you know, with um with the destruction of Germany in the aftermath of well the World Wars, but obviously World War Two, um, there's this old quotation about um you know how most nations uh, have an army, or rather you know most states have an army, but the Prussian army has a state, and there's been this sort of obsession by the the, the secularized, democratized Western powers to um, disempower, you might say, a military elite and officer class, this sort of um, portioned off army and its command and make it subservient to the civilian um, government, whereby the argument was that, you know, these military, militaristic people are, you know, they are, they have their own agendas and they are, you know, if they have too much power, it could be destructive to, you know, uh, the 
you know the civilian economy and to to world peace and blah 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 all these sort of you know typical um uh, tropes you might say of the of the anglospheric democratic ideal um what we've actually seen in recent times and particularly in the context of this war is actually civilian governments basically throwing their own armies under the bus um and have sent huge volumes of military equipment just to be destroyed in a matter of you know days weeks months over the course of this war and um and you know unlike in the old days for instance where an incompetent army officer was dismissed or had to resign um you know you see it with sort of people in history like uh, luigi cardona for instance who commanded italian forces in world war one um or indeed german generals who failed on the western front um you know were forced to set down like bulo for instance uh, was an example of that um who is stepping down from the State Department? Who's stepping down from the Pentagon? <laughs> like we have seen disaster after disaster in the West, and um, you know maybe uh, it, you know we've seen Britain like one or two prime ministers have you know been toppled, but that's not really the point. Um, the people who are making these decisions and the people who are you know ushering in this destruction are not being made to pay a price, and they are not losing their position. In fact, they're almost strengthening their power base, which is actually disconcerting, and it does, in my mind really unravel this fiction of civilian command of of the armed forces and i think that's a point that I, I don't think i've actually heard raised yet but it's actually one worth us entertaining very good thank you for furious um one final thing i forgot to mention is i'm reviewing uh, a book translated by uh, peter nimitz now uh which is torch of new russia which is the autobiography of pavel gubarev uh, basically the person i would say most responsible for organizing the Donbass resistance that started the Civil War in 2014. Um, very impressive figure. Uh, I also found the book a, a good reminder that, um, well, Russia is uh, potentially an adversary, uh, at the very least a competitor uh, to the West. Uh, it is a different civilization. And, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're stuck between the, uh, you know, a rock and a hard place uh, between Russia and our own uh, imperial governments that hate us and that's a tough situation to be in uh, but you know I, I would highly recommend actually just going and buying this book um, I think Nemitz has it's pinned on his like um, Twitter or whatever but it's Torch of New Russia um, it's uh, the Pavel Gubarev is a pretty incredible person um, and what he writes he also he, he reminds you that the West and Russia are competitors at the very least um so you know it's easy for some right you know i see this going all throughout the chat the whole time people arguing about whether like russia is like you know gonna like save the west or something obviously not um russia uh, can actually uh you know dominate us if uh we're weak uh but you know we're, we're in this situation that uh our own our own government just we, there's there's no uh there's no good force that we can back to oppose them it's like you you're stuck backing a, an evil empire to oppose this competitor civilization that actually seems uh you know less degenerate than your own so troubling stuff but gentlemen thank you for joining me for this fairly lengthy stream but i think we got through uh, a lot of good stuff today we went through a lot so if you're tuning in late i would actually definitely recommend going all the way back to the beginning and watching it um so with that, I will go ahead and end the broadcast. Thanks for joining me.